Right, let's get started. Good morning and welcome everybody to Digital West 2022. And the theme this year is cybersecurity and trust. So the pessimist will see that cybercrime is predicted to cost the world ten and a half trillion dollars by the 2025. The optimist will see that spending on cybersecurity is set to reach 248 billion by 2025. So either way, we can't escape it. It affects us all. I'm Andrea Manning and I'll be your host today. And as a late bloomer and a career changer, I I've taken the entrepreneurial and very human route into cybersecurity with my startup CyberPi, which is educating and supporting the micro businesses, those 90% of the businesses that make up Irish business. I don't believe there's another industry out there that offers such an exciting career path and with an almost cast iron guarantee that there'll be a job out there for you. So we have 10 speakers today and each slot is just 10 minutes. So it's a very fast paced day with lots of variety and something for everyone. And we're going to finish off with a panel discussion and we invite you to put your questions into the Q&A. Um, either we can address them during the presentations with our guest speakers or we'll put them in, we'll answer them in the panel at the end. Your cameras and microphones are off, so you are completely free to drink your coffee, put your feet up, um, whatever it is. You can, on the, in the top right hand corner of your team screen, there are three small dots. If you click on that, it gives you more options and there are closed captions, which will help you enjoy the experience. Um, the event has been recorded. You can't be seen, you can't be heard, and we will make a recording available at the end of the event. Um, so we have one big request today. This is the fifth year that Digital West has been running and we have a hashtag capital D digital capital W West so hashtag digital West. We'd love to get it trending for the fifth year in a row. So please tweet and share the love. Um, so if you I always have this theory about one thing. If you aim to take one thing away from today, either it's that you've got a new career path and you can see the way forward or as a business, somebody in business, you can actually, cybersecurity feels less overwhelming, less onerous, and you realize what the, what supports are out there for you, and it makes it feel doable. Um, so we have many people from industry on the calls today, and many of them will actually, I've asked them to share their journey into cybersecurity. So, because I know we have a lot of students on the call, and I would love for them to see the people that have gone before them. So now it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Orla Flynn, President of Galway May Institute of Technology, and from keeping the organization safe to encouraging students into meaningful careers, I have no, idea, no doubt that cybersecurity crosses your path on a daily basis, Orla. Over to you. Thank you, Margaret. Andrea, the year of Galeris, Michelle Orla Nilay, Nuktaran, and Shaw Institute, Technolieta, Magalava, Muyo, as Kurm, Falcher, Roger, Fad, and Shaw, Ermajan. I want to welcome everyone this morning to what is now our fifth annual uh, Digital West uh, event, as Andrea said, and we are celebrating a, a happy fifth birthday. And this is an event that's gone from strength to strength, and the pandemic has been no match uh, for our organizing team. And this year we have uh, Laura Hagerty, Turla Grafferty, and, and Noreen Henry, I think, behind the scenes. And just want to say well done uh, to those colleagues for, for persevering uh, in the face of uh, adversity there. The fact that we've been living and indeed, some might say maybe thriving almost in an online uh, or cyber world uh, this past two years is hugely relevant for our, our topic today. And in recent times, we've seen uh, some examples of how the use or our reliance on a cyber environment is not risk free. And perhaps that is maybe the understatement of the year. We've seen very high profile cyber attacks on the health service uh, in the last year and on a range of higher education institutions, both institutes of technology, uh, technological universities, and indeed more, the more traditional universities as well. And those kind of attacks have a huge impact uh, at an institutional level uh, on organizations' abilities to deliver services uh, to customers, clients, students, uh, whatever. And, and we've all seen that in, in some way or shape or form in the last time. And no doubt there's been many unpublicized cases of individuals who've been impacted by some sort of cyber crime, uh, whether losing money uh, themselves on a personal basis, whether small scale or, or large scale. And I think Andrea referenced then in between that from you know, the larger organizations down to the individual, there's many, many small companies out there, micro and SMEs, uh, trying to get by in a, in a world that is increasingly uh, reliant live and thrive in a cyber 
uh, environment. So it's not the stuff of myths. It's real. It's with us today and we do have a terrific lineup and they will shed some light on this issue uh, for us all. I'm particularly glad to see both public and private sector organisations represented today, along with academics and representative bodies such as the ITAG Cyber Forum. I'm particularly delighted to see GMIT's Fulbright Scholar, Dr Seamus Dowling, presented along with my former MTU colleague and now Cluster Manager uh, of Cyber Ar Ireland, uh, Dr Owen Gordon. Also, I'm a board member of HEANet and it's great to see their uh, Security Services Manager, Louise O'Sullivan, uh, presenting also. So ultimately, there is something for everyone this morning and uh, I really hope that you in enjoy it. Uh, I myself, uh, I'm, I'm going off at the moment now into I'm on the expert committee for the Creating Our Futures campaign and uh, there's there's no doubt many suggestions have come in from the public about tackling cyber crime and cyber awareness. So I won't be able to stay for the morning but but I am an avid Twitter user and I will be following uh, the, the hashtag uh, with interest uh, throughout the morning. So Gormagwev, August Tosulagum, good morning Shiv, Tanav Asan Majin and I'll delight to hand back to you now Andrea. Slaan. Ola, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction and what a lovely welcome to get the event kicked off. So it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Owen Byrne, who's the Cluster Manager for Cyber Island, and Eamon Larkin, who's the Program Director for DevOps at IBM and heads up the ITAG Cyber Forum here in the West. Um, so, so, so Island has a real opportunity to position itself as a world-class leader in cybersecurity and um, from academia to industry to talent and skills, Eamon and Owen are here to tell us about the work that they're doing and the opportunities for Ireland, for business, for academia and for the talent and skills pipeline. Welcome Eamon and Owen. Thanks very much, Andrea. So uh, thanks very much for the, the warm welcome and the invitation for Cyber Ireland to speak uh, at this event. And it's great to see my former colleague, uh, President Orla Flynn uh, as well. And we are really delighted at Cyber Ireland to see that GMIT has chosen the topic of cybersecurity for the Digital, uh, Digital West event in 2022. Um, I suppose like just through, through our talk split between myself and Eamon, often we only hear of the negative side of cyber attacks. Um, but what we don't actually talk enough about is Ireland's strengths as being a leader in cybersecurity. Um, we don't talk enough about the companies that are here, both the Irish companies, uh, the multinational companies, the really interesting jobs that, that are available in these companies, and the people that are working every day you know, to keep our businesses safe, um, keep government safe, keep society safe on a daily basis. And, and Andrea, what you were alluding to there, you know, the, the big challenge out there of um, the, the cost of cybercrime could reach 10 trillion by 2025 is incredible, but spending on cybercrime internationally is going to be reaching 250 billion by 2025. And that's a huge market opportunity for Irish companies and multinationals based in Ireland and people working in Ireland. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So I'm going to share some slides with you. Hopefully you can see that there. And uh, as uh, Orla Flynn described, you know, we've really seen that our daily lives now depend on digital technologies. We've seen this particularly over the last two years with the impact of COVID, where businesses and organizations have pretty much moved overnight to, to working remotely. You know, universities have moved online, lectures, teaching, exams. Um, we've seen over the past 10 years how our critical national infrastructure now depends on online technologies, whether it's broadband, the power grid, even our water supply. And I suppose we need to recognize that this move to the online connected environment opens the doors for cyber criminals. And we've seen this internationally with the number of cyber attacks, um, such as phishing and ransomware. But closer to home, uh, we've seen this also with the HSE ransomware attack last year, where 80,000 devices across the HSE were impacted, 2,000 systems, um, meaning that you know, people couldn't, uh, you know, get scans done. They couldn't get their operations. Doctors didn't have um, any background information uh, on their patients. And, and this was the most significant cyber attack in the history of the Irish state and probably one of the most serious criminal incidents in recent history in Ireland. Um, and follow that up with all of the cybersecurity attacks 
and incidents that have happened for businesses and individuals across the country over the last couple of years. So actually, uh, there was a recent report just out last year from Grant Thornton on the economic costs of cybercrime to Ireland in 2020. And this has increased to nearly 10 billion euros. So it's a huge amount, but this is only the financial cost. We're not even thinking about what's the impact on people's lives, um, uh, you know, what's the impact on businesses and society as well. And the worrying thing is this is increasing year on year, both internationally and in Ireland. And we've seen that it's been impacted by the pandemic because these cyber criminals are innovative and they're opportunistic. They will take advantage of any opportunities that are out there. So this means that we also need to be innovative uh, in how we protect our companies and our organizations from these potential cyber attacks. Along with that, we also need the people and the skills to protect our businesses, our schools, our hospitals, our government. And I think today you're going to see from the presentations and the speakers that there's some fantastic people in Ireland working to protect um, our businesses and our society without us even knowing. So a bit about Ireland's cybersecurity sector and what you might not realise is that we actually have six of the top 10 software security companies located here in Ireland. And there's a whole range of multinational companies with cybersecurity operations based around the country. As well as that, we have a really strong indigenous cybersecurity sector with a number of startup companies developing new technologies, uh, as well as Irish SMEs who are exporting across the world. And the reason why this cybersecurity sector is growing in Ireland is because we have a really, really strong talent pool of cybersecurity skills. There's a worldwide shortage of cybersecurity talent out there, and Ireland is actually producing a very strong talent pool. And that's why these companies are locating in Ireland and why we have so many Irish SMEs in this area as well. Looking at the type of companies that we have in Ireland, you have some of the pure play cybersecurity leaders, the likes of uh, McAfee, Trend Micro, Rapid7, FireEye. But there's also a whole range of companies that are from ICT, financial services, healthcare, even manufacturing that have large cybersecurity teams to protect their internal operations. But also when they're developing new products and services, they need to make sure that they're secure as well to attack. And so you have companies like HPE Cyber Defense Center in Galway uh, and Eamon, who's from IBM Security uh, in the West as well. Now, a lot of these companies actually started their operations in Ireland by acquiring Irish companies. And we've mapped out that there's over 60 Irish cybersecurity companies that are already exporting globally around the world. This includes startup companies like Andrea and CyberPy, um, to more established SMEs like uh, Intuity and, and Siren. And I think it's fantastic to see the range of companies that actually come from all across Ireland developing new technologies and solutions to address these challenges for companies. The cybersecurity companies are also spread right across Ireland. You have clusters in Dublin, Cork, Galway and Limerick. And if we look at the number of people employed in the cybersecurity sector in the West, you can see there there's for every 10,000 people in the Galway region, there's five of them that are employed in cybersecurity, which is actually higher than the number in Dublin, where it's four people per 10,000 of the population. So you could say there's a real specialization of cybersecurity in the West of Ireland. And that's what Cyber Ireland uh, remit and our role is. It's to bring together all of the cybersecurity companies from the startups to the SMEs to the multinationals together to work with the universities such as GMIT, but also the government agencies such as Enterprise Ireland for SMEs, IDA Ireland for multinational companies and the National Cybersecurity Centre. And through collaboration and all of these organisations working together, we can address some of the cybersecurity challenges that face Ireland, but also looking at that global cybersecurity opportunity. And our vision as the representative body for the cybersecurity industry in Ireland is to put Ireland on the map as being a leading country in Europe for cybersecurity talent, cybersecurity innovation, and for cybersecurity solutions. And how we're going to do that is through developing a pipeline of our own homegrown cybersecurity talent coming out of our universities, cross-skilling people from 
different careers into cybersecurity and also looking at how we're going to attract the next generation of cybersecurity professionals um, from young students, secondary schools and primary schools as well. So we have a whole range of initiatives looking at this and Aoife is going to also be speaking to you later on about the Cyber Skills Project, which is a really innovative government funded project looking at training up hundreds of new cybersecurity professionals for Ireland. And if we want to achieve our vision of being a leader uh, in cybersecurity, there's going to be thousands of new cybersecurity roles in Ireland over the next 10 years. And we need people to be able to fill these roles from all different backgrounds. We need the technical skills, but we also need people um, from non-technical areas, because if you look at it from cyber law to education, training, awareness, to policy, to business, we need people um, with cybersecurity expertise across all different areas of the economy. The other area we're working around is research and innovation. So introducing companies to the researchers in the academic institutes like GMIT so that they can work on the security challenges that industry have coming up with new solutions and technologies uh, and then being able to translate, translate those that research into new products and services and commercialize it for companies to export that globally. We also want to support startup companies in Ireland. We have a startup, a European startup event introducing Irish companies to investors uh, in Dublin in April. We have a, a cybersecurity startup hackathon for students in April as well. And we're also helping Irish SMEs to go global and to export internationally as well, attending trade missions and supporting them make contacts in other countries. And then finally, we want to attract more companies into Ireland to set up their cybersecurity operations here and help the companies that are already here to grow and to compete internationally. So to talk a bit more about um, the specific Cyber Ireland initiatives in the west of the country, uh, and our, our collaboration with ITAG Cyber Forum. I'm going to hand it over now to Eamon Larkin of IBM. Thanks a million, Owen. I uh, appreciate the, the walkthrough there. I, I echo everything you say, and really I'm here today to just give people a sense of uh, what's going on, on from a cyber community standpoint in the west of Ireland. Um, uh, as, as you say, I work with IBM, uh, which is a, an, a, an office and a cyber presence uh, in Galway. Uh, I also chaired the ITAG uh, Cyber Forum, which is essentially the Western chapter of, of Cyber Ireland, right? And, you know, if we cast our mind back a couple of years uh, ago, one of the things we, we got together and started to think about was, well, how can we build a strong community, a cyber community in the West of Ireland? How, what exactly is going on in the space? How many companies are involved? How many people are employed? What are the opportunities for people around all of this? Um, we, we, we look to focus on talent and skills uh, and get together a, a, a cohort of people from industry, academia, uh, Enterprise Ireland and IDA and other groups to, to really you know, focus on the talent and skills aspect, influence course content, um, run hackathons and other events uh, and just build awareness uh, uh, across the, the group. Um, we work with the business side of things and the SME side and startup, just running events and, and uh, uh, you know, I suppose supporting uh, business on their cyber journey. And we par partner with academia around our courses and uh, content uh, support for any kind of springboarding, uh, uh, I suppose, um, uh, funding and all of that. So. One of the things the ITEC Cyber Forum does is we run an awful lot of events throughout the year, and over the last two years, we've ramped up that uh, number of events and the number um, and the, and the, I suppose the the attendance of the, at those have been very strong. So you know, for uh, the, back in October, we rang the Cyber Security Summit, which was a, a group of industry experts coming to talk about the cyberspace. Um, ran over a half a day. We run uh, every. One Tuesday every month, a Cyber Tuesday uh, a, a event, where again expert leader experts from the industry come and talk about their experiences. Um, all of, all of the events are, are open to uh, free to the public and to the to student bodies. Um, we've also ran the Atlantic uh, a, a festival uh, where there was a, a a cyber track of five events over the week uh, back in May, and we will do that again in the new year. We have. Uh, from a, a talent and skills standpoint, a cybersecurity analyst bootcamp 
and conversion program and the next one of those is commencing in the 22nd of February for people on the live registry trying to get into cyber security. Um, we've got a, we ran a, a building cyber security and compliance into your startup event last year and we continue to support um, startup and SMEs and, on their uh, cyber journey. Uh, and in April we're running a, a cyber research conference, a flagship conference for where um, all research in the cyber space are, uh, are, are invited to submit papers and present uh, all the cyber research that they are doing um, and pull all the, that kind of network of people together so people can um, share ideas um, and, and learn from that day. So really looking forward to that April 25th uh, date. And if there's anyone out there that has uh, um, a paper or research that they're doing would like to submit, uh, just go to the, the Cyber Research Conference website and, and you can submit your, your idea there. Um, our next Cyber Tuesday event is on an April, April uh, or sorry, early February. And Mike Harris will come and talk to that report that you mentioned earlier on uh, and talk to the detail on that and some of the learning. So really looking forward to that. We're also looking to run again a monthly Cyber Tuesday event um, uh, as we go into the year. So if if anybody wants to pick up on those events, just LinkedIn and uh, it's probably the best place either, you know, follow myself or follow the um, Cyber Ireland or ITAG uh, on, on LinkedIn and you can pick up any of these events throughout the year. And as I said, all are free for people to, to attend. Um, just to give people a sense of the, 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 the cohorts, this is not an exhaustive list by any means, but uh, the number of com companies that are involved in the forum, we've got a healthy committee, uh, we've got a mixture of academia, uh, industry, small, medium and, and large enterprises obviously Cyber Ireland and um, um, all the different universities from Letterkenny, GMIT, Athlone IT um, and NUI Galway all coming together to, to drive the cyber story forward in the West. Okay, so last slide there on, please. So again, if anybody wants to get plugged in or has any ideas they'd like to, you know, feel free to link up to us on LinkedIn follow uh, all the events that will be coming out during the year. Um, there's two websites there as well that people can, can link into, but ultimately our goal is to uh, develop and, and um, drive forward the cybersecurity community in the West. And, um, you know, we've gained huge momentum over the last two years and we're looking to, again, um, gain further momentum uh, in 2022. So, um, you know, appreciate everybody here today. It's great to get the opportunity to speak and cyber is just such an exciting space to get involved in. If you're thinking of a career path in that, you know, happy to talk to anybody at any stage uh, around um, um, careers and, and, and guidance and mentoring around that. OK, thanks very much. Sorry about that, right, we're back online. <laughs> so I just want to say thank you to Owen and Eamon. Um, that was so interesting. And please visit the website on Cyber Island. You can sign up to the newsletter um, and that way you can keep a track of the events that are coming up because I think a lot of people are just unaware about how much we're doing in Ireland and how many events there are. And they are open to everybody. Eamon mentioned the Cyber Tuesdays. They once a month, they are free events. Whether you're a student or you're in industry, there's always a new learning and, you know, they, they cover different areas. So please, you know, sign up to the newsletters, visit LinkedIn or the website um, and just take advantage of the supports that are out there for all of us in Ireland for cybersecurity. So thank you both very much. All right. So on to our next speaker, um, Aoife Long. So Aoife Long is the Education and Public Education Manager at the Cyber Skills Project and she's based in MTU. She was the project manager for the Cybersecurity Academy in 2021, and she recently defended her PhD in en energy engineering. And throughout her PhD, she led a number of innovative science communication events and also promoted engineering as a career to secondary school students. So she's now bringing that experience to the world of cybersecurity. So Aoife, you're very welcome.
Thank you, Andrea. So thank you for that lovely introduction. So talking about careers in cybersecurity, I'm actually relatively new to the industry. So it's brilliant to it's been a fantastic industry since I joined in April, I have to say. I'm with CyberSkills, so I'm going to talk a little bit about what the CyberSkills project is and then more specifically my role in it in promoting careers in cybersecurity. So Cyber, Cyber Skills is a project that is initially an initiative of Cyber Ireland. So it's great that I'm following Owen and Eamon, who've just been talking about the opportunities in Ireland. So what it is, it's funded by the Higher Education Authority Pillar 3 Human Capital Initiative, which really aimed to address future skills needs. And what's innovative about the project, it is a consortium of Munster Technological University, University of Limerick, Technological University Dublin and University College Dublin. And it's led by Professor Donna O'Shea, who is the chair of cybersecurity at Munster Technological University. So it does bring together a lot of the expertise in Ireland to deliver cybersecurity courses and it's aimed at working professionals. So it's not aimed at undergraduates, it's more people who have a bit of experience in industry who want to reskill or upskill and then apply those skills in industry straight away. So courses are held in the evening again to adapt to allow people to adapt their working lives to take the courses rather than being on during the day and negotiating skipping time etc and it's also asynchronous in some instances and the cyber range is a huge advantage of the cyber skills project where people can practice their skills in labs in an environment where there isn't any real life consequences so they can break as much as they need to break so my role is more promoting cybersecurity as a career, and there's a few initiatives that I'm involved in that are aiming to do that. So first is our involvement in the World Skills Competition. Now, this is really exciting, and Dr. Giorgio Mani, who is one of the lecturers in cyber skills, is leading on the technical part. So recruiting participants to take part in our Capture the Flag event on Friday. This is open to people aged between 18 and 26. So it's really focusing on young people. So if you have seen any information about the World Skills preliminary competition for cybersecurity and you're on the fence, then do go to cyberskills.ie to the news section to find out a bit more about it and to register for the competition on Friday. It should be really good fun because what World Skills is, it's like an Olympics for professions and trades. It's been running for a very long time and Ireland has a long involvement in it over 20 years. So, so many different skills are covered to culinary arts, textiles, fashion design, welding, carpentry, and there's going to be a showcase in the RDS at the end of March, which it's looking like this will be a live event now, which is fantastic. And cyber skills is skill number 54. So that just shows you of 55 skills. So there's a huge range of skills on show cybersecurity becoming part of this stage to not just mentor people, but also showcase the skills that Ireland has in cybersecurity. So the aim of the competition on Friday is to select about six to eight strong candidates who will then be mentored to participate in the national final in the RDS and then select two people to go on and represent Ireland at this world event. And industry will be involved in the mentoring of these participants or candidates from the preliminary round again to really get strong exposure to different scenarios that are happening in industry real life. The next is the Cyber Futures website. So this is a website aimed at people who are just at the starting point of their career decision. And it's really modeled on the SFI Smart Futures website. So just the starting point to see what does a career in cybersecurity look like? Who is in cybersecurity? It features some basic descriptions of the main roles, thanks to Sean McSweeney in MTU. And also a few career stories. I've already been to Dublin and Cork filming different career stories from a range of professionals, from students studying cybersecurity right up to CEOs of their own company. So I think having the range of stories is what really is a huge advantage for this website. And finally, the Cyber Academy that was mentioned in the introduction and Owen also mentioned it. This was really kind of a flagship activity for education and public engagement that Cyber Skills was leading. We had about 67, I think, young people participate in this academy that was delivered by cyber skills lecturers and then a capture the flag event delivered by zero days on the final day. It was something the students really enjoyed and really got stuck into. 
and it was aimed at 16 to 18 year olds to really give them some in-depth tuition and experience and learning opportunity in cybersecurity. And this will be running again in June 2022, and we're taking expressions of interest for that. So I'll just Eva, yep. can I just ask you to explain to everybody on the call who may not know what a capture the flag competition is? Yep. How does it work? How does it work? So it's a series of cybersecurity challenge scenarios. So say, for example, for the academy, people would have just learned the basics of cryptography and command line programming. So it's a series of challenges and people, you know, whoever wins one challenge moves on to the next one. So the competition style really replicates that under pressure environment of solving cybersecurity challenges when an attack is happening. So that's the aim of these competitions. So the competition on Friday will be a Capture the Flag event and also in the Cybersecurity Academy we run Capture the Flags. Does that answer that? It does. And I think if you look online, there's a number of Capture the Flag competitions and you can almost sort of go into training. There's a lot of free events you can find. Um, maybe we can put up some resources at the end. Um, then I, are there any on, on the web, the cyber skills website? There isn't capture the flag courses on the website. But again, if, if that is something that companies have, because I suppose one way that industry can get involved with this website and with the work that I'm doing is to share resources. So, for example, I do have some resources from VMware. They have this online training in general technology with a cybersecurity element. And when continuous education is such a huge part of working in cybersecurity, I think it does give young people that impression of how much is available as well. That's fantastic. OK, so I interrupted you. I think you were just finishing up with the Cyber I Future just Day. I was finishing up anyway on the cyber, cyber Academy. So those are kind of the three main initiatives that I'm working on. And what are the challenges of promoting a career in cyber? I think just con communicating the huge variety of careers that are an option. It's not just an IT role, as Owen was saying. There's different roles across all levels of of industry and cybersecurity knowledge is necessary in all levels of industry. So no matter what pe skills people have, whether it's highly technical or, as Owen said, in law and different fields, they're all very relevant skills. So communicating that can be a bit of a challenge. And I think also perhaps dispelling the myth that it's just about maths and a really technical skill. A lot of people that I talk to kind of say it's more about the ability to problem solve and think in different ways and that those type of people are very welcome in the industry. Exactly. You know, when you say you work in cybersecurity, people instantly think it's technical. Unfortunately, Absolutely. there's obviously more men in the industry than women. Um, and it's like saying you work in finance. That could be absolutely anything. So I think all of us, we can do more work about the different types of careers and the paths into it. And it isn't necessarily only the technical path. There are so many people in cybersecurity that haven't done computer sciences as their major. Um, and I know later on, I've asked some of the speakers to, we've got Rebecca who's coming on from Titan and I've said to her, she's only 23 and she's really got a fabulous career. And I, Rebecca, please tell people how you got there. And she studied media technology. Yeah. And again, I think I've met, like initially my focus was on young people, but I've met so many people who've moved into cybersecurity later in life and it's been taking that route of continuous up, you know continuous education and upskilling so that kind of traditional route of studying computer science while it's very important there are also so many different other routes into the industry as well that's it um and then tell me what's the purpose of the cyber futures website you mentioned the cyber futures website yeah, so it's really it's the starting point. So what I want it to be is that people get their initial piece of information and then go further and do further investigations. So I really don't want it to be a one stop shop with all of the information about cybersecurity. It's just more to say this is cybersecurity and it's contextualized to Ireland because one of the things before I set it up and do my research, there are there is a lot of information online about cybersecurity careers, etc. And there's some very good information, but there just wasn't anything that was related specifically to Ireland. So I just really wanted to communicate the opportunities that are available in Ireland and also have a strong resources page so that people can go further and find out a bit more. So any resources, particularly people at that this conference, if you do have you know, blogs or any resources in your own company, if that could be shared with me that I can link to it, that would really beef up what we are offering and help improve the context of the information that I'm giving to people. 
I said, I think you sort of jumped into the next question, which is, you know, yeah. how can industry support any of your initiatives? And before you answer, I just want to say we've got some time. Please um, put your questions in the Q&A and we can ask Aoife for your questions. So, you know, how can industry support your initiatives, Aoife? Um, by sharing your stories. So, as I said earlier on, I've been to. I started out in Cork, obviously I'm based in Cork, moving to Dublin producing videos there. I want to go west next, so I will be seeking volunteers to participate in career videos, telling your career story, no matter what level in the industry you're at. I think students studying cybersecurity can be very good at connecting with younger people because they're much closer to where people are at, and then people who've reached really high levels can be very inspiring. So I think having both and people being willing to share their stories would be a huge help. So definitely get in touch with me and I'll be working on getting in touch with people. That's kind of one of my next steps. What's next? Um, also about how cybersecurity is valuable to businesses. So it's not just what the jobs are. I want to tell the story of where people in cybersecurity work. So if anybody is working in industry in the West in particular, because I want to tell stories from around the country, so sharing what cybersecurity needs your business has and how the people working there contribute and add value to your company. So again, people are seeing not just the role, but how valuable it actually is to business and to, to society, because the information that you're protecting is everybody's information. You know, it's their bank details, it's their email addresses, it's their you know, home addresses and sharing that information of how people can add value to a business and to society, I think would be hugely valuable. That's absolutely fantastic. Has, I'm just checking, has anybody sent any questions into the Q&A? Um, you've got a wonderful resource here with Aoife. Um, what are some of the questions you typically get asked if you go into the schools? When you go into schools? So I haven't actually been able to go into schools because everything has been so online, unfortunately. But I think the Cybersecurity Academy, like a lot of people just wanted to know where do we start? What do we study? Because, you know, particularly people of that age, that's what they want to know. And I like I would kind of strongly advise, you know, taking a general degree in computer science can be a really strong starting point because it is like arts for technology. It covers such a broad range of things and it's not that specific that people end up being pigeonholed in a way that I think they might be. So I think if people are interested in technology, then I do think that studying computer science and finding about a bit more about what their universities nearby have to offer, I think is a fantastic starting point. But yeah, like the big question is, what do I study? Because that's that's the decision point that they're at. And are there any events planned in person for this year? That's, I'm going to put you on the spot now for yeah. the rest of this year. As, as things open up and we're trying to avoid playing pandemic bingo and the new normal and hybrid working and all of that, you know, what, what can people look forward to this year, hopefully, if things do open up? So hopefully if things open up, the event in the RDS, the World Skills Preliminary event, that is planned as a live event as of now. So. I think the organisers were ha perhaps putting off a decision, but it, that is planned as a live event and that would be an excellent showcase of so many careers also in April. And this was working with zero days to deliver the schools capture the flag event. That was something we put off and we put off and we put off because we just really were hoping to run a live event and have the buzz of bringing everybody into a room. So. Going to the RDS would be an opportunity to see lots of different careers and hopefully the schools capture the flag will be getting organising that in the next couple of weeks and that will be a live event in the Mansion House in Dublin in April. That's fantastic. You see there's so much hope out there. The sun is shining and things are opening up. <laughs> it's absolutely brilliant. Before we finish up, Aoife, is there anything else you want to add? Um, anywhere you want to send people? Obviously, please, you know, go over to the Cyber Skills website. It's a wealth of resources. Um, follow them on Twitter and LinkedIn and Instagram. Um, you know, and don't forget to you know tweet anything this morning with your hashtag Digital West. Mm -hmm. We're trying to get that trending. Um, but anything you want to add before we finish up here? I think the final thing to add is to ask industry to get involved. So to work with me, showcasing careers to young people, but also with cyber skills, 
to think about what your cybersecurity skills needs are, because CyberSkills does want to work with industry to develop courses that are relevant, so that we're able to work with industry on all levels, from promoting careers and saying they're important to being very specific and saying this course will get you out of a jam and be able to improve your company and how it works. So I think, yeah, get in touch, the contact details, info at cyberskills.ie, and we'll be able to talk to people from there. Aoife, thank you so much. Um, please, everybody, get in touch with Aoife and with CyberSkills. It's a fantastic resource. And hopefully, you know, we'll, we have a number of students on the call today, really, that they now realise that some of these resources are out there for them. Because I, I'm lecturing in secure, cybersecurity, and every every lecture, the students come down and say, oh, how do we get a job in cybersecurity? How do we get a career? How do we get a placement? What should we be doing? How can we be preparing? And you always have to be preparing for your future career. So it's things like attending the capture of flag competitions, entering, entering them, um, attending the events, even if, you know, even the ones that Eamon mentioned from ITAG, the Cyber Tuesdays, you might feel that they're a little bit above your sort of learning level at that point, but you could always learn something. Um, you know, th the best advice I was ever given was when you attend an event, or you listen to a talk or anything, just aim to take away one thing. And there's always something you can take away. So I hope from Eva's talk today, you've taken away the one thing that this is, you know, cybersecurity is just a fantastic career with some amazing supports here in Ireland. So Eva, thank you so much. Absolutely. Um, thank you so much, Andrea. And I, I will say that Eva is going to be joining us on our panel discussion at the end of the event. So please keep putting your questions into the Q&A and we can address them in the panel discussion. So my next speaker, I'm delighted to introduce Matthew George. Now, Matthew is the CEO and founder of Vigitrust. Um, they provide integrated risk management solutions to clients in 120 countries across various industries. He's a featured Forbes book author with a cyber elephant in the boardroom. Um, he's an innovator and an in-demand speaker, so we are delighted to have him here today. Um, he's a multi-award winning CEO and an established authority on IT security, information government, governance and risk management. Um, and he's got more than 20 years experience. And in 2021, the French government awarded him um, the rank of Knight of the National Order of Merit. Um, he's completed extended research in the areas of risk assessment and management, payment card security, which affects everybody who's running an online business, secure printing, data storage and archiving. He's also the chairman of the chairman of the Vigitrust Global Advisory Board, um, and which is a non-commercial information security and risk management think tank. Um, he regularly writes for Computer Weekly, Tech Target, amongst others. Um, so, Matthew, thank you so much for your time today. We're truly honoured. Uh, good morning. How are you? I, I hope you can hear me okay. Can you see my slides okay? We can see you. We can hear you perfectly. Okay, thank you. Uh, well, first of all, thanks very much for the, the opportunity to, to speak today. I, I really appreciate it. What I'm going to do today is I'm going to share with you uh, a little bit of my uh, background. I'm going to be talking about uh, the risk ecosystem the way I see it at the moment. And then I'm going to share with you a couple of methodologies that you can use with regards to cybersecurity and security maturity models. Um, ideally, I'd like to leave you with some ideas uh, with regards to careers and with regards to uh, evolving within cyber and, and within compliance. There's absolutely no shortage of opportunities right now. So it's a case of uh, training for the one that you like and, and starting from there. Um, I, obviously, as you can hear from my accent, I'm, I'm French. I've been living in Ireland for about 25 years and I started VG Trust many moons ago um, in, in Dublin. And um, uh, today uh, what we do is, is we provide software as a service tools to help our clients prepare for, validate and manage continuous compliance with about 100 security standards and regulations and, and uh, frameworks around the world. Um, so uh, I, I always like to start by talking about the risk landscape. Um, and in my in my view, there are four main risks around uh, around cyber and around data protection and information governance. They are uh, geopolitical strategic risk, financial and operational contractual risks, 
reputation, brand management and quality, and then the actual technical risk around cyber, um, disaster recovery, business continuity, uh, and intellectual property and so on. So if, if, I, if I was to give you a few examples for each of them, so uh, geopolitical risk um, here in Ireland, we've got uh, we, we've got a risk that you may or may not identify with with cyber risk, but obviously Brexit is a risk um, because of data transfer and because of the fact that uh, the UK being now independent of the European Data Protection Board, the Information Commissioner's Office in the UK can decide to go a completely direction from. Uh, the, the rest of Europe or even just from the uh, the Office of the Data Protection Commissioner in, in Ireland. Another geopolitical risk would be what's happening in Afghanistan right now. So we know that um, any time that there's a, an issue with potential terrorism threats like physical terrorism, there's also a major issue with cyber attacks that might be uh, augmenting the impact of the physical attack or in fact facilitating the, 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 the physical attack. Um, another example is the impact, the global impact of the new uh, PIPL uh, regulation in China and the global impact on data protection and privacy. So that's one example. From a financial and contractual perspective, it's looking at third party, fourth party, fifth party risk looking at your vendors, looking at your extending ecosystem. Uh, from a contractual perspective, it's also looking at the impact of, of COVID and um, you know folks working from home and hybrid work and so on. Reputation and brand management is something that's really big with regards to, to cyber. It takes years to build a reputation, but one single uh, successful attack on your business and and you might be in in deep waters and then finally there's the cyber part but that's where that's the part that to some extent is the easiest to deal with because uh, there are technologies out there and if you follow the right methodology you you can actually create your own frameworks so the global compliance landscape is is you know there are currently roughly four and a half thousand regulations and standards and frameworks globally that 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 impact on data protection and and governance um, but depending on your industry depending on how you do business and where you're located the the key ones that i think you should know about would be hipaa uh, for uh, health protection uh, uh, health information protection pci dss uh, padss which is now called 3ds so pci is for payments um, payment application GDPR obviously and the equivalent in the in the US CCPA and we see that there are more and more GDPR like uh, regulations not just in the US with um, with CCPA and by the way there, there are there's probably about 80 percent of an overlap but the, 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 there's some key differences uh, specifically around consent um, but like CCPA, in, it started in California and now it's in Virginia with their own act and it's in it's coming to New York and Washington and a few other states. Uh, GDPR um, emulated the, the Brazilian LGPD and also the new South African regulation as well as the, the Kenyan regulation or for instance the regulation in Nigeria which is called ND, uh, NDPR uh, and so we, we are seeing all of that becoming kind of a global thing. Um, sorry, we've got also uh, stuff from the FDA. We've got uh, critical infrastructure protection stuff like uh, NERC and FERC or the NIS directive. Um, and we've got stuff from the office of the, the con uh, currency controller in the US, which is around managing third parties for financial institutions. So there's no shortage of, of stuff that you need to know. But at the end of the day, they all build the same way. They require you to have um, technical security. So that's a mix of technology and ways to update your technical uh, configurations. Uh, they require policies and procedures and they require skills transfer. But more than anything, they require you to do this on an ongoing basis. So I often say that security is a journey and not a destination. And so uh, if, you know, if you think about it, you might be in compliance with PCI at a particular time, but 
a minute later, you may or may not be in compliance because your ecosystem might have changed because there's a new type of attack. And so, therefore, you need to do this on an ongoing basis. The problem that we have is that as risk professionals, when we try to talk to the business um, and when we try to talk to key decision makers, we make it too legal and we make it too, I suppose, too technical. So the way a risk professional will talk is they'll, they'll talk about assets and they'll talk about putting different assets like technical assets, logical assets, intangible assets into a scope. Then they'll have a look at the different threats on that scope. Then they'll have a look at the impact, uh, the potential of the attack being successful. And that will eventually give them, after they look at the likelihood and impact, they'll give them a residual risk that they need to accept, uh, try and transfer, although you can only transfer the operational aspect of risk, you still own the risk. Um, you should never ignore risk, but at the end of the day, when you go into the boardroom with a diagram like this, you lose people within seconds. So one of the things that I'd like people to remember out of this talk is that when you start your, your career in cybersecurity and um, you, even if you're very technical, in, even if you're doing secure coding, even if you're doing network security, if you're doing pen testing, you need to do it in a way that the business will understand the various business lines as well as the board. And that's one of the things that, that that's really important because when something goes wrong and when you talk about uh, cyber accountability and cyber risk to the board, they don't necessarily answer, they don't necessarily understand uh, what you mean. So you need to, to some extent, you need to simplify it. Uh, and it's not a case that the, these people don't want to understand or can't understand. The board deals with risk every day. They deal with financial risk, HR risk, growth risk. They deal with um, HR risk, but they, they're not necessarily aware of what cyber risk and cyber accountability is. So generally speaking, when we talk to key decision makers, um, we, we, we essentially um, uh, are faced with what I call the, the five stages of cyber accountability grief. The first one is denial. Uh, they'll tell you that it, it doesn't apply to them because essentially, their job as senior decision makers, board of directors, C-level people is to grow the business, to create jobs, to pay tax and um, to look after employees. And whilst that's true, uh, cyber is still within their responsibility, but they're in denial. Then it's anger uh, and anger translates into um, a discussion that goes along the way of uh, you know, we gave you money to hire a CISO. We gave you money to hire compliance people. We gave you money for firewalls. We gave you money for training. Go and talk to the compliance and security team. Leave us alone. Then comes bargaining. Okay, well, we can see that some of our competitors are being audited. We can see that the regulator is knocking at the door of our competitors. So what we'll do is we'll hire a big firm uh, to do an assessment. And whilst that's a good thing to do, it's only the start. So you can't fend off the regulators or the enforcement bodies by doing that. Um, then comes the depression. We'll never get there. It's too complicated. But eventually comes the acceptance. The acceptance is that if you look at any business uh, of a, um, a reasonable size, they're probably doing 70 to 80 percent of it. Uh, maybe not in a way that they can demonstrate that they, they, they have the right uh, stuff in place, but um, all they need to do is bridge that gap and put their house in order in a way that they can demonstrate to the regulator. For a smaller organization, it might be more like 50%. But I mean, who really doesn't use secure cloud? Who really doesn't have a firewall? Who really doesn't have antivirus? Yes, maybe you could reconfigure it in a better way, but like you're not starting from zero, so, so it's going to be okay. So what what, what I did is I created about 11 years ago um, a, a framework called the five pillars of security. And that framework is based on the idea that whether you look at PCI, whether you look at 
the Data Protection Act in Ireland, in the UK, whether you look at GDPR, whether you look at PIPL, the PIPL in China that just came out, you look at uh, critical infrastructure protection frameworks, you always dial back to five common denominators, physical security, people security, data security, infrastructure security, and crisis management. And so if you're able to talk to the decision makers, to talk to generic employees in, in, in those very simple terms, you'll be able to get buy-in and you'll be able to really build a, a security culture that you can keep going. The way to do that is to educate the board levels and to educate C-level people, either through a face-to-face -face workshop or through e-learning. You then get them to assess themselves against those five pillars. Um, we have two versions of the five pillars, one, one that is super strategic for the board with 25 questions, five per, per pillar, and one uh, that is strategic, um, which is more for the operational people, 60 questions. Um, we make this available free of charge. It's on our website. You can get it, uh, the, the five pillars. If you're interested in getting a, a copy of it, just, just message me and I'd be very happy to, to share that with you. But it's a nice, simple maturity model that allows you to, on the one hand, create action items for immediate issues, and then on the other hand, uh, look at uh, red flags. And that can build the operational security and risk compliance program for an organization. So um, that, that, that's me. It's a, it, it's a very quick review of, um, uh, of cyber security from my perspective. Um, so um, uh, early, earlier, earlier on, Andrea mentioned the advisory board that I run. So the advisory board is a not-for-profit uh, think tank. We've got 750 members from 32 countries, law enforcement, enforcement bodies, um, uh, regulators, uh, the C-level, of course, CISOs, C-risk, uh, risk managers, uh, but also CEOs, CFOs. We've got ac members of, of academia, from academia. Um, it, it, if you're already working in the, um, in the industry, you, you can join as a chartered advisor. Uh, if you're a student or if you're learning about cyber, you can join as a community member and attend our events. It's all free of charge. Um, one thing that I wanted to, to, to share with you as well is that um, I studied languages, marketing and law. I never actually studied um, engineering, networking or, or security. And I was able to pick it up along the way because I got some good training and I'm a bit passionate about it. But at the end of the day, understanding cybersecurity, uh, understanding the technology, understanding the legal ramifications and so on, it's, it's, it's not rocket science. If I can do it, I, I contend that anybody can do it. Um, and I think that, you know, starting with very simple models like the five pillars of security, will then allow you to understand in more detail PCI, OWASP, uh, NIST, ISO, and all of the others that, that the, the recruiters will want, to, will want you to know. Uh, and I'll just conclude by saying that VG Trust is always looking for placement students. Uh, we've recruited uh, a number of graduates. In fact, we've also converted a number of interns into uh, full-time employees with, with the business. And we're also looking for security and compliance professionals from for 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 VG Trust and and also the the advisory board is a is an open framework. So um, I believe that I'm going to be on the panel later on. I'm always happy to answer questions. Uh, please do link in with me if you if you want to or send me an email. And I just want to thank again um, Di Digital West and and in in particular. Uh, Andrea and uh, Turlock, who uh, have helped me prepare for today. Uh, thanks again for the opportunity. Matthew, thank you. That was absolutely wonderful. And thank you for dispelling some of the myths and the, the misconceptions and sharing your journey into cybersecurity. And for all the students on the call, I promised that there would be a bonus. And the bonus was to, you know, to let you know that Matthew is actually looking for people like you. Um, one of the things I, you know, I've taken away from your talk is that that requirement that we need to speak human and not speak in 
legalese or in you know cybersecurity speak because we'll lose people. Um, so your Tower of Babel is a fantastic phrase. And I think what everybody can take away from Matthew is that security is a journey. Um, you, it, feel, it often feels onerous, it feels overwhelming, and that's because people think that it has to be done in one. And we all have finite resources, so it's understanding that there are supports out there, that you don't have to do everything yourself, and that nobody has their security 100% and, and tick the box and close that door and move on. So security is a journey. There's another phrase that um, security is a process, not a product. It's much the same thing. So those are the supports out there for business and such inspiration for students wishing to get into cybersecurity as a career. So Matthew, thank you again, and we will see you on the panel. So please use the Q&A function um, and put your questions in there for Matthew. Um, he's put his contact details up there. We will share them at the end as well. And don't forget, we have one, one of our targets today is to get Digital West the hashtag trending. So it's hashtag capital D for digital, capital W for West. Please tweet away and share your experience of today. Share some advice because people will go onto Twitter and we all have a piece of advice to give that we just take for given, but all for granted. And actually for somebody else, that might be that nugget of gold that they've been looking for. So on to my next speaker today. I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Seamus Dowling. Um, Seamus is the program chair and lecturer at cybersecurity um, at GMIT. His PhD concentrated on using machine learning to improve the efficacy of Internet of Things security. He's been awarded a Fulbright Tech Impact Scholarship to extend his existing cybersecurity research at the University of Texas Dallas in summer, summer 22, 2022. And he's talking to us today about how we can build trust through knowledge and intelligence and core to your message today, Seamus, is that the role that education can play. So welcome, Seamus. Thanks, Andrea. Thanks very much. I can hope you can hear me OK and see the slides OK. We're all good, yeah. OK, good. And thanks very much to Digital West, to Laura, Torlock, Noreen and all the team. It's great to see so many uh, people on the call uh, from industry and from academia and also some past students that are recognized. I suppose as an educator, I really wanted to kind of talk about where, 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 where how knowledge can play the part in building trust uh, in an organization. And, and you know, cybersecurity is, is such a, a topical um, subject at the moment, and we're all kind of nearly scared uh, to kind of be breached as an organization. And some of the previous speakers have already talked about um, how, you know, we, there's a lot of good stuff happening. Uh, within cybersecurity in Ireland, and I suppose I want to kind of bring an educator's perspective to that as uh, as well. So I suppose I want to start off with um, something that you're probably all familiar with is the World Economic Forum. It's that think tank that takes place in, in Davos every year, and every year they release a global risk report. And if we're talking about kind of trust and people's worry associated with cybersecurity, well, one of the questions they ask is you know when do respondents forecast that a risk would become a critical threat to the world and inside the you know a short term zero to two years obviously from 2021 from last year infectious diseases was going to be something that's going to be a critical threat like a livelihood extreme weather events got to do with climate change but every year i mean we have something like cybersecurity failure coming on uh, onto the radar and that's been the case for the last number of years. Uh, you know, you can imagine like uh, with the pandemic and with climate change, but we have cybersecurity just trending right there as well. Uh, after, you know, in the medium term where they, people consider critical threats to the world, they kind of see IT infrastructure breakdown in, in the medium term. And I think what's even more interesting is what they view as being a critical risk or critical threat to the world in the long term. And it's essentially an existential threat. And what they view is like adverse tech advances. So new disruptive technologies that we all embrace, such as the Internet of Things, such as blockchain, people view those as being potentially critical threats to the world. And so the whole notion of building trust into how we do, our, how we uh, um, run our cybersecurity infrastructure is an absolutely critical part for, for people. And I suppose what I wanted to look at is, um, you know, in a previous life, I worked in, in um, IT admin roles and management roles, and it was 
it was quite a, a relatively easy job insofar as, you know, all we had to do was kind of build a perimeter, a demilitarized zone, a DMZ. We had to protect against viruses, worms, DDoS. Uh, the malware was relatively um, uh banal uh, and a lot actually a lot of the, in, the threats were like insider threats where servers would go down or comms rooms would go down and we saw like Facebook recently being locked out of their entire infrastructure but that has really evolved over the last number of, of years uh, we know all about ransomware uh, we we have a whole section on APTs advanced persistent threats uh, nation states, nation groups. We saw an alleged attack by uh, Russia on the Ukrainian um, infrastructure, um, cyber attack. Uh, we have a whole raft of new tactics, techniques and procedures that are being used and they're using all the later latest technologies. So machine learning, behavioral science, data analytics, and uh, they're well-funded nation state organizations uh, that are running a lot of the malware at the moment. And of course, we have this concept of disruptive technology. Now, all these disruptive new technologies produce new attack vectors. And, uh, you know, a lot of these attack vectors are known. There are known vulnerabilities that are exploited. And, so, you know, sometimes we get a zero day attack that we can't do anything about because we haven't seen it before in the wild. And once a zero day attack um, trends or it, it uh, demonstrates a certain level of efficacy, then it's going to uh, become the variant of choice for a lot of malware developers. So the the evolution of how uh, when I used to work in tech support uh, and IT admin has completely changed into something that's really, really much more complex. Uh, and uh, I suppose an exercise in trust to just kind of demonstrate uh, how it, it can be actually viewed as being positive. I just want to show you my screen. This is my screen within GMIT. And because we teach a lot of stuff on digital forensics and incident detection response and SIEM systems and uh, critical infrastructure, we have to be able to show the students how malware works. So we have to build and tear machines apart. We have to look for indicators of compromise. We have to try and compromise the machines themselves. So invariably, we work in a virtual environment to do that. And one evening I was actually working on a piece of uh, code that was extracting credential metadata from a Windows operating system. So this is how malware offer operates. This They need to go in and they need to harvest loads of credentials, not just your username and passwords, but all, also other technical things running in the background, tickets, tokens, hashes, etc. And as I ran that, I was running that in my virtual machine and accidentally I ran the script in GMIT's physical device itself. I never thought about it. Uh, I got an error saying, contact administrator, you're not allowed to do this. And I kind of went, that's okay. And the following morning, I got a call at about five past nine uh, to say, what the hell were you up to last night? And uh, so Tom O'Connell, uh, down in technical services, incident detection and response, uh, rang me to say, "We, you, your flat machine was, was red flagged. For um, And I thought about it and he said it was 19 minutes past 10 at night and I kind of went, okay, I know what I was doing, I was working on. And uh, when I was kind of able to convince Tom that I was doing something that was quite innocent, that it wasn't uh, something um, malicious, I kind of sat back and kind of went, well, wow, that kind of gives me a lot of confidence. And it instills in me a sense of trust that GMIT's got my back and the stuff I do and the infrastructure is quite secure. And I suppose that's a, a real exercise in trust right there. And uh, as an educator, I suppose where we want to get from all these attacks that are taking place uh, that we're always exposed to, and how do we get to a point where we can have confidence in our infrastructure? How do we build that trust in there? And I suppose what I'm advocating today is that obviously coming with or being lecture within GMIT that education has to play a role in that. And Owen uh, Burden from Cyber Ireland and Aoife Long and mentioned, you know, the great work that's going on. And this, I took this map from uh, their um, website, it's a course finder, and it demonstrates all the cybersecurity, dedicated cybersecurity programs that are running uh, in Ireland. And 
a lot of them tend to be around the technical areas of uh, cybersecurity. So, you know, all the previous speakers have talked about how cybersecurity will actually expand across multiple domains and in industry, and they don't have to be core technology programs. But a lot of them are, and they involve, including GMIT. So we have um, ones on network um, cybersecurity, data cybersecurity. So a lot around the areas of ICT, industrial control systems, critical infrastructure, Internet of Things, industrial IoT, and cyber physical systems. Uh, and we have a lot of stuff on digital forensics, cyber crime, incidents, detection, and response. And then a lot of uh, programs that are out there running uh, DevSecOps, so secure programming, imp implementing cybersecurity into the development of secure uh, um, applications, uh, web applications, etc. But I suppose what I'm arguing is it can go right beyond that. It doesn't cybersecurity doesn't have to be just core technical STEM type uh, programs, but we need to be able to integrate a cybersecurity concept and content into all kind of programs, such as the built environment, building management systems, where most of the population on, on Earth are now living in an urban environment. So we have this whole concept of smart cities. We have this whole concept of smart homes, smart transport. That whole built environment requires uh, um, cybersecurity to be core to the, the, the delivery of content in that space. Um, we also have uh, healthcare. Uh, the, there's so much emphasis on moving healthcare out towards the community. The government of Ireland have this uh, shift left, stay left um, st strategy whereby uh, healthcare will be delivered into the community. That has huge implications for uh, implementing a secure uh, infrastructure to do that. Uh, we also have. Um, Sorry, I'm not clicking. We have business compliance. Uh, Matt, you just spoke a, a, a lot there about all the compliance networks out there, all the standards, all the frameworks uh, that exist around this space. We have legal and data law. The NIST 2 framework has just been released in uh, EU. It's, and it, it actually looks at how cybersecurity is implemented and across uh, the whole EU um, uh, landscape. And that includes um, sanctions for people who play who pay for ransomware and who don't disclose breaches of, of data. So cybersecurity has to be built into that as well. We also have society. I mentioned the whole idea of smart cities, uh, smart infrastructure, but also how social engineering, how we interact, how we not click on that link that appears on our on our website, that email that we think we should click on. You know, it's a whole area of social engineering like that. Transport, automotive. Uh, we see smart driving, smart cars, smart um, um, uh, haulage. That's all been rolled out as well. So cars, are, the vehicles, transport can all be remotely accessed. Agriculture is a huge space as well that, that uses um, a lot of Internet of Things devices. That whole infrastructure needs to be secured. We saw a huge ransomware attack by J on JBL beef suppliers in America last year, and they've just turned, they've turned around and paid 11 million in ransom straight away. They didn't even consider uh, the concept of actually trying to fight it. And I suppose uh, it's been touched on by a few of the previous speakers as well, that primary and secondary education is uh, is key to kind of bringing up the next generation of people that are aware. And we're not talking about delivering cybersecurity programs, but rather kind of building cyber hygiene into uh, all children's lives and making them aware of the implications of, of using data. Um, and I suppose this knowledge exists. You know, we know that all this knowledge exists about this, about the threat groups, about the threat actors. We have, you can all kind of go online and just look at the MITRE attack framework right now, and that gives us all the activities and uh, all the what's called the tactics, techniques, and procedures that are used by all the malware threat groups, all the software that's out there. And uh, I suppose if I just look at one attack which has been referenced already, which is the HSC cyber attack, and uh, we see that, you know, we know that the threat group, this is all available within the, the minor framework. We know that the threat group was Wizard Spider. Uh, we know that they used a piece of malware called Conti, and there was another element associated with Cobalt Strike as well. We know all those tactics, the techniques, and uh, the procedures uh, that they use, that this malware uses, and we're able to then, then implement mitigations associated with that. So how do we solve this? How do we kind of mitigate against these attacks taking place? And so 
that information is very much already being built by a kind of security community. And it's it's easy to kind of in, um, transfer that knowledge just away from core cybersecurity programs and embed that into other domains and other industries as well, as I already referenced. Um, and I suppose it, it kind of would be remiss of me not to talk about uh, GMIT and what we do here. And, uh, you know, some of the courses that we do uh, and we deliver are quite technical. So they're in the area of network cybersecurity and data cybersecurity and cybersecurity operations aimed at secure ops centers. But I suppose for this particular audience that we're talking about today, uh, we also have a higher diploma in cybersecurity risk and compliance, which is a really good amalgam of um, kind of the, the, the legal, uh, the frameworks, the governance, and some of the technical uh, stuff as well to be able to kind of help an organization improve their cybersecurity posture. And that's available, that's Springboard funded, HCI funded, and uh, all you just go online onto Springboard and just uh, search for that one. I suppose the last thing I want to just kind of reference is, uh, or highlight and Eamon already referenced it previously is the Cyber Research Conference of Ireland. This is our first conference, uh, inaugural conference. It's been held at GMIT's Galway campus uh, on the 25th of April. It's in conjunction with ourselves, GMIT and NUIG. So uh, if we, if you have a piece of research that you want to submit a paper for, or if you want to attend to be able to see uh, what's kind of going on in the landscape of cybersecurity research, it's open to academia and industry. So it would be a really interesting event to attend. And uh, that's it. Uh, thanks very much uh, to, as I say, to Digital West for inviting me. I really appreciate that. If anybody uh, finds of any of this content of, of interest or want to collaborate, then feel free to reach out to me on any of those communications uh, for to continue the conversation. Thanks, Andrea. Seamus, thank you. That was wonderful. And it's so good to get the educator's perspective. So just to reiterate, we are recording and we'll make the recording available and we will make a, little, a small presentation just with all the contact details of each presenter so that you can get in touch with them. Um, I think the one thing I want to kind of get across is that in cybersecurity, sometimes I can feel that there's gatekeeping, but really what's coming across today is there is no gatekeeping. It's the, the, the gates are open, come in. If you want to attend the cyber research conference, you can. All the Cyber Island events, all the ITAC events, um, they were all free and open to everybody. There are so many resources out there. And again, Seamus, thank you for highlighting the springboard courses. So please go on there and have a look what's available for you. Um, so Seamus will be on the panel. So please put questions in the Q&A and we will look, you'll be able to address them to Seamus directly when in the panel discussion. Um, don't forget to get hashtag Digital West trending for us. Um, I'm going to check in with Hannah in a while and she'll tell us if we are trending. Um, so my next guest is Paul Fitzpatrick. And Paul is a detective guarder on the Garda National Cybercrime Unit. And he's working as a computer forensic examiner, examiner and a cybercrime investigator. Um, he's currently undertaking his master's in forensic computing and cybercrime investigation at UCD. And Paul, I think everybody wants to hear about both your day job investigating cybercrime and what to watch out for, but also from a career's point of view, because digital forensics is, is such an interesting field. So welcome, Paul. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thanks, Andrea, and thank you to everyone involved at Digital West for the invitation. And it's great listening to all the speakers that came before me. Some great information. Um, I'm just going to share my screen if I can. Okay, are you able to see my slides? Yeah, we can see them, Paul. Okay. Yeah, that's perfect. We're good. Uh, thank you. Okay, so I, as my name is Paul Fitzpatrick. Um, I joined on Garda in 2003. Um, I actually started my Garda career in Galway Garda Station, not too far from GMIT, where I spent three and a half years just in regular policing. Um, I then moved to the east and I joined uh, Garda. Uh, computer crime investigation unit in 2008 um we've been there now the garda national cyber crime bureau we're based in uh, harcourt street in dublin and we also have uh, hubs around um, 
around the country. So we have one hub just straight across the road from GMIT in the Western Region headquarters. Uh, we have a hub down in Wexford, Cork and Mullingar. So they're, they assist us with the um, forensic uh, investigations and uh, cyber investigations. So what we are tasked with, with forensic examinations of digital media that are seized during the course of any investigation. So that could be the bulk of our work would be child abuse material, uh, child exploitation, possession of the imagery and distribution of it. And we also investigate um, if criminal offences of a significant or complex nature that include accessing or the interference of information systems without lawful authority. Um, we also liaise with partners that include the academic institutions, Europol, Interpol, uh, the FBI and other law enforcement agencies. Right. So I'm here to talk to you a bit about the ransomware because ransomware is it's rampant um, in society these days. And we've seen a lot of, especially with the HSE attack that happened occurred last May. I'm going to talk a bit more about that later on, <clears throat> what we learned from it as well. So basically, what is ransomware? It's a form of malware that gives the criminals the ability to lock the computer from a remote location. So the majority of the malware is dedicated to theft. So they're mainly after your personal identifiable information or a PII as it's generally known. And um, that is used, they will sell that online to other criminals who will use that in the likes of phishing, smishing or vision campaigns. Um, also, can be used for theft of resources. So it can be used for using a computer to mine cryptocurrency. So they generally would attack companies and use their resources to mine their cryptocurrency and to make money that way. Um, ransomware is also a very effective method of blackmail and extortion. So they steal the data and then they encrypt it. So what they do then, uh, ransom notes are, are created on the inf infected information mm -hmm. system. There is a demand for payment mm -hmm. for decryption key. Um, and if you don't pay, there is the threat of posting data on the internet. The motivation for these attacks, mainly it's financial gain. So they're organized criminal groups. So that's basically the career criminals the, um, and a large amount of attacks these days are sophisticated and they take a lot of communication. So there is a lot of communication and underground forms between these hackers um, and other threat actors. And where they swap ideas to sell services and then they sell the results of the, the attacks. Um, there's also low level criminals who may attack, um, they may attack people, individuals, or they may attack small, medium, large businesses, um, just basically for, for themselves, but they're not part of any specific group. We also have the political issues, so you have the hacktivists, so they may be anti-government, anti-large um, companies, and the, the will attack um, the company networks. And there are also nation states, as we've heard earlier on, like you're talking about the likes of Russia, China, the Korea, um, who will attack each other, or, or cyber espionage. Now for the HSE, that occurred on the 14th of May uh, last year, so it's the largest cyber attack in the history of the Irish state. The HSE is the largest employer with over 130,000 staff. There are over 4,000 locations and over 70,000 endpoints within the organization. And the incident came to light in the early hours of the 14th of May. Um, and many of their IT systems were affected as a result. So it was established that the infection of the first computer, which is called Patient Zero, it occurred on the 18th of March. So this was eight weeks prior to the execution of the malware. So the user clicked on a malicious Microsoft Excel file that contained a phishing email, uh, or contained in the phishing email that was received two days prior. So access was gained to the HSE's information system and four of the malicious files are downloaded. So once the, the file, uh, the Excel sheet um, was opened, it goes off and it'll connect to an IP address or another domain. It'll download further uh, malicious files. And these files are used to access uh, accounts with administrator rights. So they're, they're raising their, their own privileges as they go through um, the, the domains. 
They then, once they get the, the data that they're seeking, so they, that data will be copied out of the servers, and then the ransomware is detonated. So this is the, from the Conti group. And again, these groups, you could have five people involved, or you could have 20 people involved. It's um, There's generally a person who will get access to the system, or even the person before that who was hired to send a phishing email. So um, there's a large group of these people involved, and they all, uh, they all share the spoils if there is payment made. Now, the decryption key, it was released by the country group. Now, no payment was made by the government, and the recovery commenced upon verification of the decryption key. A little bit about phishing. So this is what led to the attack. So it's an attempt by cyber criminals, nation states, or hacktivists to lure the intended victim into giving away personal information to gain access to their accounts or to affect their machine with malware. And it can be through the variety of channels. So mainly it's email, social media, or text messaging which is also known as smishing. It can be the use of the infected email attachments, PDFs, Excel files, and or there could be a link to fake websites asking user to log in so they obtain your details. Or it could be drive-by malware, so when you visit these websites, they will download uh, malware to your um, computer. Just to give you an example um, of a phishing email, so you can see in the middle, a lot of people may get emails like this um asking people to sign in now but as you can see in the bottom left what it it's best done on um, a desktop computer so when you hover over the sign in now button you can see down the left at uh, the bottom left that the link is not uh, to coinbase and you can see at the bottom of the screen the full link and even at the top of the, um, the email or hide it the email address is like they should ring alarm bells when you receive these type of emails uh, smishing scams. So, again, there's been a lot of those highlighted, even on the Garda Info page on Twitter and the Garda Facebook page, where we constantly send out um, images or screenshots of these uh, scams that are going around. So, again, there are variations of the, and these, in this example, it's the permanent TSB um, bank. So, they're sending out uh, variations of the link that will bring you to um, a fake website where you will be asked to log in using your username, password, or PIN numbers. And once they have that information, then they can um, clean out your account or they can sell that information on to somebody else. Our advice for advising, for avoiding ransomware attacks. So, again, as has been said, by previous speakers, awareness and training is key. Tra train your employees that are working for you um, to ensure that all emails are scanned and outgoing emails to detect threats. Don't open any email attachments or links unless you know or trust the source. Disable remote desktop protocols or RDP as they're called. If they're not being used, <coughs> disable them. Keep your operation systems, um, software, and applications updated, and back up your data. So it's important to keep an offline backup. How often you do it, um, that's totally up to you, whether it's weekly or monthly, but depending on the size of your information system, that'll be up to the IT admin. Now, when we're investigating incidents um, of ransomware, we rely heavily on the IT department or the third-party company who look after the IT for that company. And they will do their internal, internal investigation and provide us with an report, a report. So if there's IOCs, like the indicators of compromise, could be IP addresses that were used um, in the attack. If there was malware, if there was a sample of the malware, we would look for samples to these files. So we would analyze them as well. And Seamus touched on earlier on how he examines them. So we would use that, but we'd also use Europol's malware analysis system so that's used, that's basically a large sandbox to tell us what the malware does and if it's making any connections to any IP addresses or domain. So to the command and control server, as uh, the cryptors like to um, keep control of the malware and keep access to the to the affected, infected machine until it's time to detonate. So our advice is do not engage with these threat actors. 
or pay the ransom. There's no guarantee that your data will be released or you get a decryption key um, and report the matter to your local guard station. Now, and lastly, just to touch on the cybersecurity baseline standards. So these were published by the government on the 30th of November last year. They were developed by the National Cybersecurity Centre, the NCSC, with the Office of the Government Chief Information Officer. So basically, they're there to improve security of information, communication, technology, infrastructure in public services. So these are baseline standards that will help organisations understand the security risks and how they can prepare for such attacks. Now, it's not only for the public services, it's also for the, the third party companies who provide IT support for the public services. Um, I think that the standards will could be released maybe every 18 to 24 months and that they will be mandatory, mandatory down the line. Um, so that's, that's it for me, just to give you a brief overview of what we do. And if you have any questions, I'll be on the panel later. Thank you. Paul, thank you so much. And I think, you know, that, that's the message out there is that we have a dedicated unit in the Garda Shinkana to support us and don't engage with cyber criminals and report it. The amount of people that try to sort of bury it or think they can handle it themselves, you really need to call it out and you need to report it. And if you take away one piece of advice today from Paul, the other one is to back up your data. Um, because obviously Paul's seen this on a, a daily basis when businesses are just faced with ruin because they don't have a backup or they haven't tested their backups. Am I right, Paul? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, it's a very good point. Test your backups regularly. As it in, if you keep an offline backup or if you can spread the load across the network. So because what they've been doing, they're getting into your networks, they're encrypting the backups before they detonate the malware. So it's very important. That's the thing. And, you know, the, the other thing that comes across here is so often it goes down to the basics. When you talk about the HSC attack, it began with somebody clicking an email, but yet the repercussions we're still dealing with now, it's it's absolutely huge. But it so often it is the basics and there is so much help out there and support. I was going to mention at the end, but I know even in Galway, the local enterprise office, we're running a, a cybersecurity course for businesses. And I think I looked it up this morning and it's 25 euro. So, you know, yeah. educate yourself reach out, get the support, they can help you to then work on those baseline standards and start building security into your business. So Paul, thank you so much and we'll see you later. And please put any questions in the Q&A and we can hopefully address them. So on to my next guest, Colm Healy. Um, so Colm is the CEO of Karata um, and Colm, because we're going to just have a chat and we're not going to do a presentation, we're going to try and make something. thing. I'm just going to hand it over to you now and you can just introduce yourself and tell people who you are and what you do um, at Karata. Andrea, th thanks. Thanks very much. And uh, first look, delighted to be at the event today. It's a uh, it's a great it's great to see all the different aspects of the cybersecurity ecosystem within Ireland so well represented here, both the from the education side, from the public sector side, um, from the uh, multinational side, but also, you know, a good representation I'm delighted to see of uh, indigenous Irish uh, cyber companies, including um, Titan HQ from Galway, obviously, Vigitrust and, and Karata, both from, from Dublin. So uh, really delighted to be here. Um, just a little bit about um, my own background and um, the uh, and indeed the you know, background to Karata as well. Um, so um, my background originally um, up to about my original my original um, background was in financial services and uh, in data analytics. Uh, about 20 years ago, I got involved in the uh, the startup um, with the, the, my first startup a company called Zion Technologies. And I've really been involved in um, mobile technology really since then, since the 2000s or so, really as the, you know, witnessing the sort of the growth of, of the smartphone and uh, how I suppose mobile has come to be such a ubiquitous part of uh, everything we do. So a number of years ago, myself and uh, my co-founder, Brendan McDonough, we set up Karata. We saw 
We saw that there was a gap in the market for um, a technology that would secure uh, mobile devices from the range of cyber attacks that uh, we could see starting to starting to emerge at that point. Um, and now, which frankly have become really, really common. Um, I think Paul was talking a little earlier about phishing. Specifically, he mentioned he showed an example um, of a smishing attack, and, and that's one of the you know, probably the thing that everybody has gotten over the last, certainly over the last two years, everyone must have at least, uh, must have received multiple um, smishing attacks to their phones. Um, and we'll talk a little bit later about, you know, the background to that and, and what, what we can do to address that. But um, that's probably the thing that people are very most familiar with in, on the mobile side, and we're um, we're very committed to uh, to addressing that. Um, but there are a range of other more sophisticated attacks, which we'll, we'll talk about a little bit later on. Um, but Karada, I guess we we sell our software solution um, to to businesses primarily, um, both public sector and private organisations, and they use it basically to ensure that their uh, devices are are safe, uh, safe for use in their business functions. Um, you know, a number of years ago, businesses used mobiles primarily for email, um, but now. Uh, the mobile applications um, and other services are all, you know, heavily, the mobile phone basically and the tablet is integrated into the business processes of many, many businesses today. And, you know, that's only accelerated the pan with the pandemic, with um, the, I mean, I, again, it, it, having been, you know, in this business for maybe 20 years, it, it, it is, you can, re I can really, appreciate how uh, the pandemic has accelerated digitization um, and by that I mean that you know even businesses traditionally which would have obviously we are all familiar with e-commerce we're all familiar with um, businesses like banking which are digital their very nature is they're digital but really what we've seen with the pandemic is that um, every business you know from construction to logistics um, to uh, pharmaceuticals, every business has has become a, a digitized to a much greater extent than ever before. And of course, you know the implication of that, of course, is that they are much, much more exposed to uh, to cyber risk, um, to cybersecurity risk. So, you know that has been that has been the um, the the experience. That that's you know that is the I suppose the the mega trend. Um, that Karata is addressing. Um, people in, in Ireland, our software is sold primarily um, in conjunction with uh, Three, the mobile operator. They sell it under the brand of Three Mobile Protect, and that's a partnership that we put in place um, a number of uh, years ago and uh, has proven very, very successful. And it's, it's actually particularly what it's done is it's helped particularly small and medium sized businesses who wouldn't necessarily have the, their own um, ex, in depth expertise in a space like mobile. It's helped them to you know, have a, a access um, a really high end, a really world leading technology in a way which is easy for them to buy because they're buying from from an existing supplier and someone that they trust and someone they know will be able to select the right solution for them. So what, what makes security on mobile different from security on desktops? That's a, that's a great question, Andrea. So look, look, so we're all probably, you know, we've had antivirus for for desktops for 20 years, probably more actually, but other people here on the, on the, phone, on the call will know better than I. Um, but mobile is very different. It's different in, in good ways and bad ways. I suppose the good way is that the, the, the operating systems, Android and, and the Apple's iOS system um, have been built from the ground up to be much more secure. And um, in particular, uh, what they do is Generally, when you download an app onto your um, onto your phone, that app can really only um, access parts of the phone that are that are to do with that app. So it can only look at its own data. It can't go searching around the phone for data from other apps. That's really good. That's what's that's called segmentation, and it's a really really uh, par helpful thing. Also, the the in, in Apple in particular, the use of an app store for distribution of software. There's only one place you can get software from, and it is that software is vetted. Um, the same is true in, in it's not, the same isn't quite true in Android, but it certainly the Android Play Store helps to ensure that there's good standards there. So they're the good things. So the phone is inherently a bit more secure. The challenges are the way, probably primarily around the way in which we use phones. So phones are unlike a 
you know, desktop or laptop, which is clearly a often a fully dedicated business device, or it's 80, 90% business. It's probably controlled by your organizations. They can put various software controls on it. They can lock it down in ways that prevent you from doing bad things. And phones aren't like that. Phones are typically what they call dual use devices. So, you know, inevitably you're using your phone both for personal and for business purposes, which means you get this mix. It's used in a much more casual way. Um, so, you know, one example, um, I was listening to, a, um, I actually was a, a, a Garda presentation there uh, a week earlier in the week, and they were, point, they were saying that a lot of the smishing attacks are now happening around times like, um, times like when you're picking up kids. And of course, you're there, you're, you're, you're at your most distracted and you're um, at your least vigilant. Um, and so when those smishing that smishing message arrives in, you're much more likely just to click on it um, than when you think about the environment where you receive um, a, a, an email on your on your desktop where you can you can consider it, but you look at it in a much more considered in considered way. The other thing, of course, is that the mobile devices are much more private and that, of course, limits the ability of businesses, your business, your organization um, to examine what's going on, on the phone. So it's a really difficult um, difficult, what would I say, a balance that the, that uh, businesses have to to strike between between um, putting security technologies on the phone to protect the phone, um, but also making sure that they don't um, end up putting their employees under surveillance. Um, so the, the, the again, and finally, you know, the, the actual small screen, the fact that it's a small screen, it's much makes it much more difficult to spot um, the indicators that would allow you to pick up that there's something there's something going on, there's something wrong on the phone, or you're being you know, someone is attempting to scam you or defraud you. So they're like just some of the things that make I think um, phones and tablets very different from uh, traditional uh, traditional um, desktops and laptops. That you know the IT industry is very well uh, versed in 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 controlling and securing, albeit you know it still encounters massive massive difficulties. And what what are the biggest threats that you're seeing today on mobile? You know, there's there's probably look out for? yeah there there's 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 three big threats on mobile. So one is the and they kind of they they they're they they vary in ubiquity and severity. And I'll start with the one who's most ubiquitous, but in one way the least severe, right? So it's a classic. Um, text message or smishing scam or any type of phishing on mobile. So so one of the things about mobile is today we have we don't just do email and SMS. We do Slack and WhatsApp and Facebook Messenger. So there's like multiple tools that every single one of us uses on our phone for communications and collaboration. And every single one of those tools can contain a malicious link, you know, a, a link to a bad place that's trying to scam you in some way, whether that's to download, get you to download some, some malicious software, um, or whether it's just trying to steal your credentials. And probably that, that credential theft, that thing of, you know, finding out information about you, getting your password, getting your username, um, is, Re, you know, every, virtually every single serious hacking incident starts with a phishing attack, with the uh, bad guys getting their hands on your on details about you. So, for example, on a phone, like one of the things that I, you know I'm increasingly doing now is when if I if I see a phone number coming up on my phone, and um, I don't know the phone number, I won't answer it and give my name. Because remember, if you give your name, and this is a this is a malicious actor, they now are able to associate a name with a phone number. Um, likewise, if you have someone ringing up in the bank and saying, "Look, uh, we want to," I want to, they ring you and they say, "I want to verify who you are," and they start asking personal details. I'm, you know, very low to give those personal details now. And actually, what I'll do is, can I? I'll ask to ring them back. So, you know, phishing, getting information, credentials on your phone is the thing we all that that we've all experienced. We're all exposed to, and it is by far the most ubiquitous um, attack we see out there. Um, and it's difficult for the, the mobile operators. They try to um, try to protect against these things, but it's extremely difficult because the you know if you if you think about um, the bad guys trying to get that link onto your phone, it's almost like you know it's almost they have so many different paths it's like almost like a road network you know you know when you when someone arrives at your when a car arrives at your at your door 
you've no idea where it ca you can't tell where it came from. Where did it start out? It's a similar thing with with uh, with with smishing uh, texts. Um, the mobile operators really have great difficulty understanding, you know, controlling where this stuff comes from. And these attacks typically each each malicious link it probably it probably only lives for six hours. You know, it's probably it's it, they're they're generating hundreds of thousands of these every day. Um, which makes it extremely difficult to control against. Now we have technology that attempts to address that, that does address that very, very successfully actually. Um, but in general, the, the plane, you know, when you've got a normal device um, running normal software, you're going to struggle to to be able to identify those divide those those bad links. Basically, the rule is don't don't click on any any links you get from an unknown source or or, or, or really from anyone other than than someone you know, uh, not from a business, not from anything else. Um, I know because in the pandemic now we've actually reached the point where you make appointments to phone somebody. You don't actually just phone anybody anymore, yeah. and you you don't answer your phone if you don't recognise the number. Ab and abs absolutely, and it's yeah. Sorry, Andrea, go ahead. Yep. No, no, no. That's it. And you know the other thing with the phone is we're all multitasking. I am not on my on my Mac at two o'clock in the morning when I can't sleep, but I'm on my phone watching TikToks at two o'clock in the morning, <laughs> and I'm you know that it's it's. If I was a cyber criminal, that that's my, that would be my attack target. Would be the phone. Because okay. Well, now and, and, and now and Andrea, you've told everybody all the cyber criminals on this call some very good, useful personal information that will allow them to target you very effect, very effectively. But anyway, the uh, <laughs> the second type the second type of attack that um, we see it's less ubiquitous, but it's more dangerous is um, is attacks against Wi-Fi. So essentially, when you're connecting to a Wi-Fi hotspot in a you know in a coffee shop or whatever. It's you're very. It's very easy to compromise that because people who run coffee shops are not cybersecurity experts. Their their business is not is not having brilliant cybersecurity infrastructure in place. So it's really easy. It's really easy even to physically get your hands on the on the the access point and compromise it. So again, a really a really dangerous thing, particularly if they're trying to get if they're if a cyber criminal is trying to target a particular organization. When when people go back to work. You know, people typically from a particular company often end up in the same coffee shop. Um, cyber criminal wants to get their hands on credentials for that particular um, for that particular organization. They set up an attack in that coffee shop. Um, really easy, to, really easy to do. Um, again, typically it's when you're targeting someone. And the final type of attack, and this is the you know, it's 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 this very advanced malware which is used by. Typically, very sophisticated attackers, often nation state backed, um, but this is software that can literally take over your entire phone and literally every single thing you do, every every letter of every that you press on your keyboard, every message, every every um, uh, photo, anything that you have on your phone can be accessed. I mean, it's very sophisticated. Um, one of the most well-known is a thing called Pegasus malware. It it's, was produced by a, in, an Israeli um, cyber attack company, I suppose you call them, called the NSO. Um, and it's been used to compromise, well, we know it's been used to compromise um, various uh, civil rights activists. It's been used to, it was used, for example, to compromise even Jeff Bezos when the Saudis weren't particularly happy with them. So there's a range, uh, you know, it, it's very sophisticated. It is extremely difficult. Without software like Karatas on your phone, it would be impossible to detect that you had been compromised by this. And this is what the, I mean, from the attacker's perspective, the beauty of that technology is that it is, it is silent. It doesn't, you, there's, it leaves, it leaves no visible trace uh, on your phone from the to the to the um, to the uh, to the the the, the layperson. Obviously, a forensics uh, expert like Paul would be well able to to identify and and, and um, extract it. But uh, that's the that's the sort of the, the third and most dangerous type of attack we see. So I think the Jeff Bezos story was brilliant because if it can happen to Jeff Bezos, you know, a tech dude. It can mm. happen to anybody, and I think that's what people need to realize. He wasn't aware that that spyware was on his phone. Mm. He was blackmailed. Again, you know, the repercussions were huge. So that brings us to our final point. You, you know, what can people do? What is out there for them? Is it simple? Is it, you know, does it require technical know-how? Mm. What are the solutions? Well, I think I think you know, for businesses, organizations, well, we generally call organizations um, who have formal cybersecurity programs, all of which you know, which is typical what you, you find here in almost every organization today. They they need to take proactive steps and and put the right software on their on their devices to protect them. There's no getting away from it. There's too much. There's too much at um, at risk. 
Um, individuals can do that as well. It's more. I think it's just it's more difficult. I think um, for individuals, it's more about vigilance. It's more about common sense. Um, they're unlikely to be targeted by in the way Jeff Bezos was. Um, we never know. Um, but the and actually one of the one of the organizations we're very involved with is uh, the Coalition Against Stalkerware. So, for example, that is where um, it effectively intimate crime, where um, people you know well are trying to um, uh, spy on you, essentially. So, you know, that again um, is, a, is a threat that's out there. Uh, but gen generally, it's common sense. It's, you know, don't be, hand you know, keep control of your phone, password protected, make sure it's, make sure the operating system is up to date. I know it's annoying. Sometimes you get these requests to update your operating system. Uh, you know, they, both Apple and Google are very good at responding when, when a, a new, a new vulnerability is discovered, they rush out patches pretty quickly, and that does that is really important. Um, and then, just as I said, just common sense. You know, don't be clicking on links from people you don't know. It's as simple as that. Um, and even if you do know them, just be very cautious about um, um, putting in information. I mean, I've seen it in my own family. I've seen people do it. People I thought were well versed in all this. They'd, um, I've seen them um, be fall, fall prey to these things. Thankfully, they haven't lost money as so far. Um, but again, it's it's just be very vigilant. I think that's the that's the message. Colin, thank you so much. I know I have a lot more questions, and I'm sure that the audience do. Please put them in the Q and A because Colin is going to join us in the panel discussion. Um, but mobile security it's something that's often forgotten you put the security on your desktop but you don't actually put it on your phone and you forget that your phone is a computer it is just a smaller one and it's it's actually an extra appendage as well because let's say it's in your bed with you at two o'clock in the morning if you're watching tiktoks so thank you column and we'll see you later so now to introduce my next two guests it's louise o'sullivan and Lei shell from hea net they are ireland's national education and research network Leigh and Louise are going to cover some of the ways we can avoid becoming victims of cybercrime. Louise has a background primarily in IT audit, security consulting and cybersecurity working in companies like Deloitte, AON and PricewaterhouseCoopers. Um, I've also asked some of our speakers to give some background on their role into cybersecurity for the students on today's call, um, because you can't be what you can't see. And Leigh has a master's in digital investigation and computing forensics from UCD. So, this gives her some great cybersecurity street cred. So Louise and Leigh, you're very welcome and I'm handing over to you. Thanks very much for that. And thanks so much for a great event today so far. It's really, really interesting. So I'm just going to share my screen. So hopefully um, everybody can see that OK. Um, can you see that there, Leigh? Yeah. Brilliant. Fantastic. Great. So what I'm going to go, go through today, I suppose, is just um, as well, I suppose, how I got into to cyber to cyber security as such. So as, as Andrea went through there, um, I'm a security manager within HGNF, but I didn't start off just working in cyber. I actually worked in risk and compliance. So I did a degree and master's in um, NUI Galway. So I did BIS and then I did a master's in international management. So something completely different to IT to gain a, a further uh, understanding, I suppose, of, of what's happening in the industry at the time as well. So um, I also am now a certified information security auditor and I'm, I'm an ISMS implementer. So that's an information systems management system implementer. So again, you can completely um, enhance your studies even after you do your degree and your master's as well. Hi everyone, and I am Lei Sha. So it's very happy to be here and to share my experience. So currently, I am a security and a risk advisor in HANet. So I'm mainly focused on penetration test, vulnerability scan, and phishing campaigns. So previously, I was working in IBM for five years as an ethical hacker. So for someone who is wondering what is an ethical hacker and what is penetration testing do, so I was being given the written permissions from the client and the mission is to hack into the systems or the services, the web applications the clients provided. Um, I'm also a fan of a lock picking, so it's um, it's very um, useful skills and um, so the lock picking actually is using a special token locker instead of the original 
So the logical behind is very similar as the penetration test. And, um, and um, uh, so, but I uh, just uh, um, talk, put the ethical behind uh, before that is like, I only open the log like for my own and I don't I want to open other people's log until they ask me to. So um, how I get into the cybersecurity, I did as uh, undergraduate this last year of undergraduate of sci um, computer science in GMIT. And then after that, I did the masters that um, Andrew introduced in uh, UCD. Thanks very much for that, Leigh. So as you can see, Leigh has a vast amount, uh, wealth of knowledge in the penetration testing side of cybersecurity. So some very interesting findings she does be having when we work with our clients. So just to give us uh, you guys a little bit of an understanding of what we do at HEANET and I suppose the cyber elements we look at. So we provide a suite of services to clients and they include five different elements currently. So you can see from the graph there, the first element is a security and risk assessment. So what we would do is gain an understanding of the environment of our clients. So our clients would be the likes of um, institutes or universities or anything to do with the education sector as such. Um, and then what we would do is we'd work on um, policy review and development. Um, policies are very, very important these days within security and even from my IT auditing days as well, we do focus an awful lot on policies and the implementation of policies as well. The third element, which is the element that um, Lay works in, is around penetration testing and vulnerability scanning. And this is very important these days as we are working an awful lot more within um, online systems, online applications. Um, what we have seen in the past two years, and of course because of the pandemic, it, pandemic is a very big increase in security awareness training. Last year alone, we trained over 2,000 um, people and over 50 sessions for cyber security training. And we do cover elements which the On Guard of Paul talked about, which is around smishing, vishing and ransomware, but also other elements of how we can stay, stay safe ourselves in our day-to-day -day lives. For example, if we're going onto TikTok, if we're using social media and so on. And the final element there that we do cover within the services is um, access to security confidence. So creating a safe area for our clients to be able to talk about security, talk about incidents and to share knowledge. We're really, really pushing the sharing of knowledge because, you know, an issue that we can share between somebody, they can help us fix it as well. So they're just some of the elements that we, we cover within the service. So why is education a target to cybercrime? Well, we have to remember that education is a potential gold mine. There's a lot of information, I suppose, that is handled in large amounts. So we've given some examples there, like, for example, there's a finance department within um, education areas. So you've got payroll, you've got invoicing, you've got grants, a lot of money is, is involved. There's also emails, so personally identifiable information. Um, there's personal information both on staff, on students, on, you know, on vendors as well. And there's also elements such as technical resources, so technical documentation and also around standards as well. And there's a lot of research that does happen. So we have to remember as well, there's sensitive research data and intellectual property. And one such example is the University of California two years ago was doing some research on COVID-19 vaccines and they fell victim to ransomware attack because cyber criminals are very opportunistic. They don't really care what is happening in the world. All they wanted was money. And in that instance, the, the university itself within um, California actually negotiated the ransomware and paid $1.12 million to the, to the cyber criminals in that as well. So let's have a look at um, what we can do to prevent cyber crime. And um, just wanted to share a few items here today with you and um, that we have, we, we usually covered um, in our security awareness training to the clients. So the first one I want to say here is security awareness training. So that's what, um, that's the key and that's very important. Um, like Paul mentioned and Colin mentioned about the phishing, that's um, the ways of the cyber criminals they usually uh, use to hack us. Um, that's what we usually like, covered in security awareness training. And we do recommend you to not uh, use any unsupported um, or obscure systems or software, uh, such as like Windows uh, XP, Windows 7, that's uh, all unsupported 
unsupported systems we know because we they don't re they they won't receive any uh, support uh, from the vendors which means no security patches will be released so what the hackers will do here is they will look for the uh, versions of the systems that people are using and they will look for the public vulnerabilities and then hack from there and we also do recommend you to keep the system software up to date. So, uh, for example, on Windows, they release um, updates, patches regularly, so we can keep an eye on that. The last one here we want to mention is to ensure um, the critical services or admin pages such as your HR system, uh, payroll systems like are not publicly available. So can put them behind, um, we call it virtual private network so that um, those critical services are not publicly available for, uh, for everyone else. And I just want to say another element and uh, that we can use um, individually in our day to day life is multi factor authentication is also called a two factor authentication in short MFA. So what is MFA um, it's a combination of two of the following something that you know, like the uh, the pin or password that you created something that you have like a key or a card like a bank card, something that you are the biometrics like your fingerprint. Um, a bank card is actually a very good example. So the card is something that you have and the pin is something that you know you created for your own. Uh, actually, uh, a lot of the services that we're using in our day to day life, they have started to offer um, MFA in order to verify our identity. So such as the online banking and um, after you put into the pin or the password, there will be another um, another one time code uh, sent to to your phone by the text message or authentication app. Uh, such as whereas well like the LinkedIn, PayPal or um, the message app like uh, WhatsApp. They've all been using MFA. Thanks Leigh for that and I suppose this leads nicely on into password management. So we talk about multi-factor authentication and how useful it is, but also I wanted to give you some really interesting statistics that were, were released last year on password management. So a Google survey found last year that at least 65% of people reuse the same passwords. So they reuse the passwords in a number of different applications. So you're probably asking, oh, well, what's the issue with that? Well, it's worth noting that a cyber criminal called Kyle Milliken, who actually went to jail for, for actually hacking into people's accounts, he said he used to love when people use the same passwords because he was able to hack into a number of different accounts and that he despised the multi-factor authentication mechanism because he actually was fairly unlikely to get into any information because there was two steps involved in it. So you can see why we shouldn't use passwords as well. Uh, we use the same passwords. And it is worth noting that, you know, 91% of respondents did claim that they understood that reusing the same passwords probably wasn't the best thing to do, but they still went on and used it as well. So it's, it's just worth noting that if you do get breached at some certain point, then in turn you might get breached in a number of different applications if you use the same password. So they're just some very useful statistics, you know, just to take away today as well on that. So you're probably wondering, well, why would anyone want my information? So what does happen to our breach data on the dark web? Well, passwords or, or credit card details can end up on the dark web. And you can see here some very well known logos like Spotify or Netflix or PayPal. And you're probably saying, wow, well, that's only €2.75, it's not actually that much money. But a very good example was Fastway Couriers last year that were part of a data breach within Ireland. So 450,000 accounts were part of that data breach. So if you take that 450,000 and say there were €2 Euros each for each account, that's €900,000 that potentially the cyber criminal can make money on. So it's the, the vast amount of accounts that are being breached, OK? So it's just worth noting that so that's where it's very lucrative for these cyber criminals and this is why we really need to mind and manage our accounts and our passwords as well. So I thought what would be good to end on is to talk about a website where you can see if you've been part of any breaches and the website is called Have I Been Pawned? So what you can do within this website is you can pop in your email address and you can see if you've been part of any breaches. So in this example I've used my work email for the first um, example and luckily enough I haven't been part of any breach with my work email address. But when I pop in my personal address, I can see that I've been part of four breaches. So what I would say to anyone is don't panic. 
We say this to all of our attendees in our training sessions, don't panic. The main thing is to read more about the um, data breach that happened, but also have you changed your password if you've been part of a breach? Because if you haven't, that password is potentially on the dark web and is available to cyber criminals. So for example, LinkedIn and Glowfox, you can see there, I would have changed my password immediately when I would have heard about those um, data breaches. So I thought we'd leave you with a very uh, good website to have a look at after the presentation today and after all the presentations today. And again, if you have any questions at the end, we'll be, we'll be happy to, to take them. So from myself and Leigh, we want to say thank you very much. That is just a couple of key elements that we do discuss at our online training with our clients currently. So thanks very much. Leigh and Louise, thank you so much. That was so helpful. And really what you've just reiterated is that, you know, the onion of cybersecurity, there's no one silver bullet, there's no one thing you can do. It's layers and layers and layers of security. So get the security awareness education, change your passwords, put multi-factor authentication, go and check if you've been breached and, you know, take advantage of some of the supports that we've highlighted today. Um, but it really, I want you to take away from today two things, either that if you're in business and I want you to feel empowered that cybersecurity is completely doable with all the support, or if you're a student or a career changer and you're looking at cybersecurity, what a cool industry to get into and there is something for everybody. Um, so Louise and Leigh, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. And we'll share your details again on the website at the end of the event. So if anybody wants to get in touch, they can have a thing and we'll connect with you on LinkedIn or whatever. So on to my next guest now, my final guest. This has absolutely flown by. I can't believe it. And thank you to everyone who's been tweeting. We are now trending with hashtag Digital West. Please don't let that slip. Keep it going and keep your Q&A coming in for the panel discussion at the end. So Rebecca is the customer support team lead with the global network security specialist Titan HQ. She's here in Galway. Her role in the company is to manage the support team who troubleshoot technical issues. Um, and while and with a the real theme of, you know, strong customer support, because when you ring up for IT support, chances are you are frazzled, you are pulling your hair out, you are stressed out. You need somebody like Rebecca at the other end of the phone. Her professional interests include research, problem solving and coding. And prior to starting with Titan HQ last year, she completed a work placement as an IT technician at a London based IT and project management training providers, Firebrand. So she only graduated in 2020 with an honours degree in media technology. Um, and Rebecca, I'm going to hand over to you now. I want you to tell us all about cybersecurity and your career path into it. We see you. Hi, Andrea. Hi, yeah. welcome. Hi, uh, thank you so much for having me. It's lovely to be here. Um, it's so it's an honour to really like speak in front of all the students, especially since I just graduated myself. Um, so I'm just going to share my screen here. Um, so one second. Can does everyone see that? Okay. Yeah. OK, perfect. Um, so yeah, I am uh, the customer support team lead of a company called Titan HQ. So I'm just going to give you guys a bit of a background of what, um, how I got here and uh, pretty much what I've done in the past. Um, so I'm only 23, so I don't have that much experience, obviously, but I'm originally from County Mayo. Um, I went to an all girls school in a small town in Claremorris um, and went to uh, Maynooth University uh, where I studied media technology. Media technology was a uh, double major degree. So I graduated with a double major in media studies and computer science. So it was great. They both interlinked well together. Um, kind of gave me the side of I got to do the things that I was interested in, which was film, film studies, and also kind of like the things like app development, web design. And that also linked in well with the computer science side in regards of, you know, coding um, and cybersecurity as well, uh, which always is linked into. Um, so when I graduated, um, the from my experience in whatever um, work placement I had done, um, I had worked in London for a little bit and um, my first kind of thought was when I came out of college was I wanted to learn more. I felt like I was not fully uh, equipped in my technology skills and I wanted to, that was the first thing I wanted to develop more, uh, but I felt going into the working world rather than going further into education was uh, the best way to do it. So I started applying for uh, support roles and that's where I landed in Titan HQ in County Galway, which were based in Salt Hill. 
So I st I've worked there since I've started working there in 2020 and four months ago I got a promotion. Um, so my current role is the team lead of the customer support team. Um, so my day to day tasks would be uh, pretty much, you know, um, helping the guys troubleshooting uh hider tickets uh taking phone calls with the team uh managing the team uh trying to make them as productive and as efficient running as possible um as well as trying to provide um the best customer support we possibly can um the customer support team is so vital in this type of industry because we're the direct communication between organizations that are worried about their the the threats that are out there that are worried about um you know their own cybersecurity and protecting their own organization so that's it's such an important role to be in and it's such an important team to be a part of so just going to talk to you a little bit about my uh, the company that we uh, what I who I work for and what we do. So we're Titan H it's Titan HQ and we are a private equity firm uh, based in Galway. So um, our actual basis is in Galway, Ireland, uh, but we have customers from all over the world. So we deal with customers from the reigns of mainly in the US. Um, I think about 50% of our customers are in the US, but then now also ranges from Dubai, New Zealand, UK and Ireland. So we have customers all over the place. Um, so we're a cloud security vendor and the things that we offer is um, email protection, DNS filtering, email archiving and phishing protection. So we have four products that um, we then actually um, use in order to offer this protection for customers. So spam tie-in, this would got to, this would be um, incorporating the email protection and also phishing, phishing protection. Um, Web tie-in, which is DNS filtering um, and also phishing protection. Arc tie-in is email archiving and encrypt tie-in is again, phishing protection and um, encrypting data between transfer of emails. Um, so all four of our products are, um, obviously important, but the two I'm going to mainly speak about is the spam tie-in and web tie-in products because they would be our biggest um, products that we would uh, that we would sell. So spam tie-in is an anti-spam engine that cleans, um, basically cleans out your organization's emails. It filters everything through. So before it actually reaches the end user, um, it's been filtered, it's been checked and made sure that it's actually safe for a user to open and click on any links that's there um, and make sure it's not a scam, it's not phishing or it's not annoying annoying spam that you guys would uh, see all the time. It protects against cyber attacks and malware. So it's it's a really important uh, product that we use um, in order to help organizations protect um, themselves. Because email is obviously such a widely used um, communication, especially within an organization. It's pretty much, you know, the first thing someone does when they go get their coffee, they check their email. So if you're not fully awake enough, um, you know, you can give your, your users training and you can give your company training, but this just as, as an extra protection so that way then you're not half asleep before your morning coffee and you accidentally click on a link you're not supposed to. You know, we can't always be aware of things that are going around us 24-7. Um, so this is an extra protection for those users who, you know, they can sit back slightly, still be vigilant, but there's an extra layer that the organization is protecting themselves against. So the main things that Spam Titan would offer will be the likes of email protection and spam and spam blocker. It's um it's highly effective spam blocker. We use rule sets and uh, plugins and so on um, in order to actually effectively scan through the email, check to see if it's a spam or anything like that. Uh, we offer like a double antivirus protection. Um, so it's twice as effective. We use two different antivirus tools in order to scan emails. Um, we also have um, allowing a block list, which allows customers to either whitelist or blacklist, you know, certain um, IPs and also certain um, email addresses. So if it's a well-known frequent uh, spam email address, you know, they can just add it to the block list straight away without even it getting filtered or without even getting tested. Um, same with if it's a well-known correspondents of the company themselves, they can actually then whitelist the email address or whitelist the IPs that they're coming from. So there's no chance of the uh, mail then getting blocked as a false positive or anything like that. And uh, we also have advanced reporting and recipient verification, which is also another um, great thing that we can utilize within the um, filtering of emails. We also have data link protection. So that adds a powerful uh, there's powerful uh, prevention rules in order to prevent internal data loss. And obviously this prevents breaches and um, exposure for the company as well. We utilize um, the tools like that are public to um, 
pretty much anyone, any organization online. Um, so we have dedicated RBLs as well as public RBLs. And this would be um, a sort of blacklist of IPs that are well known for spamming. Um, so once they get listed on the RBL, they would immediately be kind of blocked. Uh, we also utilize uh, content filtering tools. We have uh, built in uh, content filtering tools and they're very powerful. Um, they include comprehensive um, rules that look for certain patterns and so on. Um, we are also um, have a, a tool for attachment blocking. So, you know, rather than getting an email and there's an attachment that um, basically could be some form of malware, could lead to a malicious site or anything like that, um, you can then either choose themselves whether they want to block certain attachments like exe files or um, anything like that, um, or dot doc files rather than docx files, um, uh, just to keep your um, organization extra secure as well. Uh, we also offer outbound filtering and this actually can help prevent um, their sending IPs from getting blacklisted and help them gain a better reputation so they're not known for sending out spam as well and helps protect their correspondence too from um, you know malicious spam um, as well if they find somehow you know someone has managed to try and find a way of sending uh, mail from their organization, you know, we can then filter out that mail and it will get blocked before it reaches the end users on the other side. We also have a powerful next gen uh, sandboxing security solution that protects against advanced email attacks. So that's spam Titan in a whole. Um, it's it's pretty much used um, to filter anything in or out of the organization coming through email wise. So it's a well put together product, quite a complex, uh, many tools within the actual product itself. Um, we then have Web Titan and Web Titan is a DNS security solution. Um, so just as a little background in case you're not familiar with what that is, it basically monitors whatever links or sites you um, at the end users in an organization are clicking on. It will analyze them um, and then if it's deemed as malicious or unfit according to policies, it will actually just be blocked for the end user. The end user won't be able to get to that site. Um, so uh, it's provi it basically provides protection from you know cybersecurity threats um, as well as you know filters whatever the if the if an organization wants to monitor um, what end users can actually get to during the working hours. For example, they don't want anything anyone browsing to alcoholic websites or gambling websites or anything like that. So again, it offers um, very similar. Similar technology, but works in different ways. Obviously, um, there's malware protection, content filtering. Again, um, there's flexible policies where, like I said, the um, you know the manager, the management, or the admin team are managing this uh, this uh, technology. They can decide whether they want to allow some users to browse to gambling websites or allow some users to browse to you know the websites of computers uh, deemed other computers and technology. Um, then we also have a uh, secure BOYOD and that is protecting basically uh, remote users on site as well as uh, users at home. So this has actually become a huge uh, driver for web tying, of course, since the whole pandemic on everyone working from home and that in itself was a whole huge vulnerability for um, organizations because they had to just pack up their whole infrastructure and almost just kind of like let it spread amongst wherever anyone was where uh, anyone was was living and you know for the likes of us we have people based in Dublin we have people based in Sligo we have people based you know all over the country so this was huge when it comes to um, actually protecting your organization and still being able to um, manage and uh, protect your organization no matter where um, they're trying to access your network. Um, our infrastructure is actually API driven as well. We um, have uh, reporting management and, and monitoring all based on, um, on API calls. Um, again, phishing protection, it's such a huge part of our products because it's such a big problem. It's such a big thing that we need to prevent, uh, provide um, and protect uh, users against. Um, so then we also have, you know, again, ma malicious detection service and real time updates, which is also really important. So we can identify newly uh, new threats that are pretty much immediately propagated to the database deployments. So this means when a new, you know, malware is detected um, or anything like that, we can immediately propagate that into the the, uh, the databases that we host and, and the infrastructure that we um, that we maintain and monitor. Um, so that way then we're always up to date on the latest scams, the latest spam um, and the latest malicious content that um, are trying to get to the end users in order to compromise a company. 
Um, so uh, this be I don't, I'm not going to go into too much depth by this because this was covered a lot by um, uh, by a lot of the other speakers. But these are the type of things that we're looking to protect you protect a company against. Um, you know the likes of phishing, BEC attacks. Um, so that's where they like tar would target um, high privileged users because obviously they will have more access. They would have access to more. Um, uh, valuable information. You also then have the likes of malware, which is what the HSC were, and I think it was um, it was uh, Paul Fitzpatrick who was actually displaying um, an email where there was a malicious link. That'd be the exact type of um, content that we would end up blocking, that we would filter and prevent even reaching the end user. So before the end user has to even stop and think about what they're clicking on, it wouldn't even get to them. That's that's the type of things that we would we would block and we um, help organizations to uh, manage and, and maintain their security. Um, ransomware, which is obviously a type of malware designed to encrypt files and uh, withhold information from the organization, stopping production and stopping operations. Um, then you have DOS attacks, uh, denial of service attacks, the purpose to disrupt companies' network operations again. Um, so for an example with that would be like the Google attack in, 20, in 2017. And then you have a little bit less of a complex type of attack is typo squatting. And this is something that Web Titan would be hugely um, effective for as well in regards of where an end user, let's say they mistyped Facebook or something, they put in a zero instead of an O. Um, and that's very easily done by anyone that's typing, anyone that's typing very fast as well. Um, you know, web type, uh, uh, cyber criminals can basically obtain these domains and obtain these sites where they buy them and they attach malicious, malicious content to the, to the, uh, the site itself. And then when a user accidentally browses to that website, um, a, gets their their laptop encrypted and you know that leads to a load of other problems and after that and making the, and the organization compromised so web Titan would actually some stop something like that in regards of if it was deemed as malicious it would actually just get blocked by the web Titan server itself it wouldn't allow the user to get to the to the end website so that's just a, a, a brief overview of the type of things that we offer. Um, we also do have um, a free trial um, available just on our website, titanhq.com uh, forward slash sign up. Um, so this would be for any organizations that um, would like to uh, try out our, our any of our products um, if they're looking to um, have an easy, efficient way of keeping their organization, organization secure that's not too, um, especially organizations that aren't too tech savvy, that aren't really fully up to date on, you know, how to protect themselves um, or, you know, have any complex um, uh, infrastructure that they need to they need to protect. Um, also, just a final thing as well. Look, we're hiring. I know there's a lot of students on the on the call as well. And look, I was one sitting there just like you guys um, at a lot of calls like this um, only two years ago. And um, I just would like to say that if you're interested in a job in cybersecurity and not just in the tech side of things, you know, we're hiring in all areas of the department in finance and marketing and sales. So if you would like to even just have a, you know, dip your toe in the pool of cybersecurity, there's so much to learn, so much training and look, anyone can learn the tech, the tech of it. You know, it's not just you need to have a degree in that. Like I said, I had a degree in media technology. I had a basis of computer science, but it was a bit, I like to say all the time, the job I do now was one lecture slide of one lecture in one module in my three year course. So, you know, it's it's very niche market and there's so much time to learn everything. Rebecca, thank you so much. And I love the way you summed it up that your entire career now is based on one, one lecture slide. And I think any student or anybody who's been at college can completely relate to that. So thank you very much and please stay on now for the panel discussion and um, the rest of our presenters that are staying on for the panel discussion, if you can turn on your cameras. Um, we've had some brilliant questions come in. I'm going to start with one to the panel first, which is just a general one. You know, if, how do you make cybersecurity a priority in your organization? And if you do that, you know, you're putting the burden on your employees. What are you going to take off their plate? So Aoife, you came up with this one. So I'm starting with you. And then if we can just go around the panel. OK, and I suppose the, I'll just give you a bit of background. The reason I came up with this question is because I'm coming from, you know, the world of climate change. That's where I did my PhD. And again, there's so many suggestions of what people can do. But I also think we're just coming to the end of hopefully a pandemic. People are exhausted. So when we're adding something to people's plates, what do we take away? 
And I suppose my suggestion is to look at, you know, look at the whole context of the business. And I think Matthew's presentation was very interesting from that point of view. Getting the tips and tricks is brilliant, but they live in the context of the workplace and the pace of work and what's expected of people. So my suggestion is to look at the entire context of the workplace and what people's workload is and are there processes that could be streamlined or improved just, that just give people that little bit more headspace when they're flying through emails every day that they have the time to pause and say, is this legitimate? Is this not? That's my perspective anyway, to start with. So Matthew, do you want to jump in there, I think? So I think it's it's always um, a balancing act, isn't it? Uh, mm -hmm. Because on, on the one hand, you want to uh, you want to continue uh, working as always. On the other hand, you um, you want to be aware of the surroundings here, and um, it's it, you know it's uh, I, I think it's a balancing act because it goes back to the concept of risk appetite. Uh, you know, um, how much risk do you want to take, and how much should you take? Um, the, 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 the one thing that you can never do with risk, as I said earlier, is ignore the risk, right? And so um, uh, we, we can't ignore the risk. Somebody else, in fact, a number of the speakers spoke about security awareness. Uh, my level of risk tolerance is probably different than some of the others on the panel. Um, and, and I think that I have to work it out myself in terms of uh, where where my risk levels are, and my risk levels might be different for business than they would be for my personal data or my personal um, sorry my my digital footprint uh, from a personal or a business perspective. So I don't know if I'm going the right direction here, uh, or if that's what you had in mind. If I well, there's no right or wrong answer. It, 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 I just say it's individual to each organization and each person. And Colm, I know when we spoke. You know, as a, as somebody who's providing a tech product, can the tech take away some of that burden? And how do you draw the line there? Well, that's I mean, that's you've actually stolen my answer, uh, Andrea, to the question. I mean, I, I think it behoves those of us in the cybersecurity technology space to create solutions that make it easy for uh, the harassed end user who's got 50 things coming at them and is distracted in loads of different ways, make it easy for them to do the right thing. So in a way that they're not even aware that they're doing the right thing, they're just doing the thing that's easy to do. So we just have to be very thoughtful about when we're putting security solutions in place that we just have to be very thoughtful at the user experience, make it the I always think of it, it's like skiing downhill. It's like make it so that it's the obvious easy thing to do rather than trying to clamber uphill by making it difficult by introducing um, by introducing steps that get in the way of, the, of just the being productive, which is really what we're what we're trying to do. Now, I do think that cloud, that the whole set of cloud technologies that are coming are helping to make that easier. And Seamus, do you want to jump in here? Yeah, I, I mean, I'm always struck by getting an email or a text that says my DHL, DHL package is arriving. And I suppose because we're all working at home and we're shopping online, I actually have to pause for a second to say, did we order something? Is there a DHL package coming? Maybe I'll just check it out. And you know, you asked the question, Andrea, what can we kind of take off the off, off the plate of, of our end users? And let's say, for example, I did click on that DHL link that came in, in on an email. It's kind of really um, um, confidence building to know that the systems are in place, that even if I do mess up, uh, and I, I've, I've done it before, you know, and I'd probably still do it again, that I'll still click on that link, uh, that there are structures in place that will actually capture this behind the scenes. I kind of, in my presentation, I demonstrated the example of doing some kind of work and it being red flagged uh, within, you know, GMIT the following morning straight away. But that, that's what didn't happen within the HSC. That's why the threat actors were able to be inside in the systems in the HSC and laterally move and find the mother load over the period of months. 
Whereas in my situation, uh, it was flagged and it was dealt with immediately. And that's, I mean, I think if the structures are in place and the technology is in place, then it kind of behoves a lot of industries to be actually able to implement those systems. And that kind of abdicates a little bit of responsibility from the end users, just in case they accidentally click on that link. That's it. And Paul, obviously you sit in there from the other side where people are telling you, I wish I'd made it a priority. I wish I'd done this and it's it's too late. Yeah, exactly. Like we're lucky enough in our organization, our IT department, they have email filtering in. So at least um, we know that emails are being filtered in, in incoming and outgoing. And they'll always have the, um, I suppose, the, in the, the red warning that this email has come from outside your organization and only open it if you trust it. So that's all organizations should have uh, a warning like that. And then we have our own internal communications who will email us out uh, maybe once a week of different scams or um, that might be going on at the minute so that, that we are aware of. So again, it's increasing awareness. Now, I have seen um, some companies who have been, let's see, they receive an email, but it's from a trusted source, but that trusted source has been hacked. So even though you think it's it's a genuine email, their email has been hacked. So whatever, and then it's a threat actor that might have rule changes in their email. So they're they're gaining or they're getting all the information. Be big side bands. They're looking for financial information, or they could be sending on malware. So that's something to be aware of as well. That's it. And then Rebecca, do you get people finding you? Well, I, I put the you know I installed this product, so I don't need to do anything. You know. The, thinking that the product will take away 100% of the burden where we know that you know social there's no product that can protect you from social engineering it's a human hacking a human um Exactly. I mean, that's where it comes in. You, you know, you need to be able to have the technologies in place, but also you need to make sure that you have the security training, you have the awareness with the end users. But having the technology in place can release a little bit more of the burden. It can release a little bit more of the pressure. But, you know, you should always be aware of your surroundings because at the end of the day, there's always going to be, you know, there's always going to be people that are trying to exploit other users, that are trying to exploit businesses and they're getting better and better every day you know we always have to try and just be that one step ahead of them you know we have to move as quick as they move so yeah it's definitely important to make sure that they're everyone is aware of the risks that they're taking when if they're going to click on that link that's it and i think it's knowing when when to ask for help because we all have finite resources whether it's time whether it's know-how whether it's money we're a two person organization or a 5,000 person organization. We have finite resources and there's only so much we can do. And, you know, they always say you, you can't protect 100% everything 100% of the time. So I want to move on because we have some great questions come in from the audience. Um, and I'm just going to read them out and we can see who, if you want to jump in and answer. So the first one says, I've witnessed the distress cause to workers who happen to be the one to click on a malicious link or attachment. Is it possible to investigate if cybersecurity awareness training could be made mandatory under existing health and safety legislation in the same way as fire safety or manual hand handling training? Is this something Cyber Island could lobby for? Cyber training for me is the one area that can provide massive benefits across industry, regardless of scale, from startups to SMBs to enterprise. And 100%, you are singing my song. And you know that's why I set up CyberPi because. It was literally to give the 90% of the micro businesses, those small businesses, a piece of the cybersecurity pie because everybody needs support. And the first place you start is with that security awareness training. And it's not a one and done challenge. You cannot put them in a room for an hour once a year and tick the box and go, we're done, because that is, you know, that's death by PowerPoint, literally. So anybody want to jump in and answer one of, answer, address some of those points in there? Yeah, I, I, I'll jump in, Andrea. I, I, th I think we have to start thinking. I mean, it's a great, great point. And the analogy with health, other health and safety or fire safety um, uh, things that we take for granted is a good one, because I think you know, we should expect that given that we are so utterly reliant on um, digital today, we should be treating it in the same way as we've traditionally treated other safety systems. Um, we should treat it as seriously. We, you know, when we, we expect organizations to make sure that their buildings are secure and fireproof and go through various steps, that doesn't mean that buildings don't burn down. 
but we do expect them to take those steps and we really should have the same expectation of organizations that are dealing that are they're providing us with services that are dealing with our digital lives we should have the same expectation of them and that one part of its training or there's a whole load of the, is the whole panoply of of steps you need to take to ensure that your your organization is cyber secure if i can bounce back on that i, I totally agree with, with what colin said but it, it's worth noting that under gdpr there is a, a requirement for security awareness uh, if you take payments by credit card under PCI requirement 12.6, you need to train people upon hire and once annually. Um, and under the Companies Act in in Ireland, uh, there is uh, uh, sorry, there are uh, requirements and mandates for directors to ensure that uh, the uh, intellectual property. Of, of the business, that the data of employees and so on is, is kept secure. Um, and so, of course, security awareness is, is, um, is, it, it is um, the first line of, of defense. Security awareness, however, is only effective if it's done on a regular basis. So that thing about upon hire and once annually, that's really the very minimum baseline. Uh, in my humble opinion, you, you're, you're much better doing little snip, snippets of, of training every month uh, to make sure that people get engaged. And there are definitely ways to make um, security awareness fun. You know, you can do like uh, uh, a security awareness quiz that's moderated by a third party. And it's both it both works as a, as a team exercise and as a security awareness mandatory training. And, and, and in addition, I think going back to the mandate for security awareness, there are two times every year where every company anywhere in the world should really uh, push for security awareness. That's Global Privacy Day on the 28th of January, and that's the uh, Security Awareness Month in, in October. Um, so it, it's something to keep in mind. There's like, you know, if you do something in January, then you do something before the summer, you do something in October and then you do something fun just before Christmas, there's already four opportunities to make it fun and make it an, an ongoing journey. And make yeah. it a positive thing, you know, yeah. instead of the negative reinforcement, as in you clicked on a phishing email right now, you're going to be punished and you have to go for extra training. You know, celebrate it and go, man, that was such a good one. Even you fell for it. Let's all learn from it. And, you know, Dr. Jessica Barker, she's the real expert in the human side of cybersecurity. And one of the things she does when she do goes into an office is they have a clean desk policy. And instead of punishing the people who don't have the clean desk, they go around and they leave chocolate bars on the clean desks. And it's so clever. It's just changing the perspective and making it a positive, not a negative. Seamus, you were going to say something there. Yeah, I just wanted to come in on that one as well. I, I think it's a really interesting question. It's a great point. And, uh, you know, a lot of the cybersecurity programs or upskilling or reskilling that is out there tends to be around the very technical areas in the stem and as, as uh, you know matthew and colin just mentioned there if it, it i'm not sure can we make it mandatory but if it's certainly part of of uh, an organization's uh, strategy for towards continuous profession uh, development and it's not something that they just do once and then you know that's ticking that box but this is something that's ongoing as matthew said maybe three or four times a year because you know, most of the speakers at this event have have mentioned the kind of the shifting sands and the evolution of of malware and the threat groups, and new attack vectors are going to come out all the time. And at the moment, where there's a lot of concentration on the social engineering side of things, so I, I think it really kind of is important that organisations invest in a continuous professional development. You know small programs or small upskilling events in the area of uh, social engineering. Anybody else want to go on there or we go on to the next question? I might just add on finally, I think kind of Matthew's point about the team building element. I think having in, like moving cybersecurity training from like some individual knowledge to a common goal of the business is something that would be very powerful as well. 
and empowering people instead of just saying, you know, like often the IT department is, you know, the department of no or the department of no fun. And it's you can't do this, don't do this, don't do this. It's actually if you come across something or you hit something, this is what you can do. Um, that, that's also very, very powerful. So, Paul, I would say this one is definitely for you. What level of threat should be reported to the guards? I'd normally ignore text. Um, I suppose, well, well, a lot of the text messaging, unless you're directly affected by it, like, you know, um, it, most of like, I'm, I know I'm getting them regularly myself. Um, I wouldn't report, I just delete them or sometimes I look into them myself if I can't find out whether the main posted, I'll contact the, the hosting company, see if we can get it um, shut down. But yeah, generally, we do have, uh, we do like to gather intelligence here as well. So there is there is a facility for reporting here as well. So if especially if you have been affected by it, report it definitely to the local guard station. Or you can email it to the um, district office here, which is gnccb.districtoffice at guard.ie. And uh, at least it can be assessed and it can be forwarded um, for assessment. Well, that's it. And obviously, if you've been a, a victim of cybercrime, 100% you have to report it. Yeah, yeah, correctly. Um, we're, we're happy to engage with every, everybody. I like, guess it'll be reported to the local guard station and they will forward it for investigation to the Guard National Cybercrime Bureau. And we're happy to train anybody who's been affected by it. Um, sometimes it can be dealt locally by a local detective who, who has, we, we do have people who have been trained in cyber investigations all over the country. Um, and as in, it doesn't have to be ourselves, it can be the local station that can assist with that. But due to the amount of uh, texts and uh, <coughs> emails that are going out, it's impossible um, to investigate everyone. I can imagine. So here's one for somebody's looking for some careers advice. I have two plus years of experience in project management and currently pursuing a master's in business analytics. Can I switch to cybersecurity now? Yeah, I, I, could, I, could, I suppose I could, yeah, you can take this one, but uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, there's uh, a ample opportunity for people to be able to pivot away from um, a, dis a discipline into, into cybersecurity. If somebody's in the area of data analytics, I think that's going to be a very well sought after uh, skill set in the area of cybersecurity. I get a lot of contact from uh, alumni and students who are now in positions of, of you know, CTOs and, and uh, IT managers. And a lot of the times they're looking for, for people who have the softer skills, not necessarily the technical skills associated with cybersecurity. We're looking for uh, people that have the skills in project management, as, as you just mentioned but also interpersonal skills and the ability to be able to kind of think outside of the box. And, you know, if somebody's got data analytics, I think you know, they'll be very welcome in the, the world of cybersecurity. So we have to wrap up now. So to wrap up, I'm going to start with you, Matthew. If there, what is one of the misconceptions around cybersecurity that you'd like to clear up? You've got the stage now. You can clear up one of the misconceptions about cybersecurity. And that's going to go around to the audience, to the rest of the panel. So you've got a couple of minutes to get your thoughts together. Uh, so I, I think that the the main misconception about cybersecurity is that it's a, a pure technical problem that needs to be dealt with by technical people. Um, I think the, you know, we spoke about social engineering, we spoke about security awareness, we spoke about uh, training, we spoke about understanding that you can pivot your career, uh, that you can uh, get into cyber with no technical skills uh, initially. Like I don't have a technical bone in me by default. I just had to uh, um, have one uh, implanted, you know, to some extent. So um, I, you know, I, I think that um, it, it, it's a, a, we need to understand that security uh, is a mix of technical stuff uh, process, procedures, awareness training, and it has to be a continuous process. If you don't understand that, then uh, that might be an issue. But I, 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 I do think that uh, the technical only approach to cyber 
is probably not the right one. And to be fair, there's very few uh, at this stage. There's very few people that that would that would think that. Uh, so what we need to do is we need to simplify the message in a way that the business can understand it. And uh, somebody mentioned the Department of No earlier on that uh, we, you know, as security people, become the Department of safely enabling. Uh, us to do better business and more business. That that would be my my uh, final thought, I guess. So. That's a fantastic wrap up. I can actually leave now. Um, I know you have to catch a plane, so Matthew, if you want to dash off, you're welcome. But thank you so much for your time. It's thank, been thank so you again. valuable. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, thank you. Right, Aoife, what's one misconception you'd like to clear up today? I think the idea that it's not just for school leavers. I think when I first started in the job and it was very much my own misconception that I would need to focus on school leavers when talking about moving into careers in cybersecurity. But the more people I talk to in the industry, you know, they talk about how it's important to have a mature skill set and to understand business needs and to be able to communicate. And again, just to be able to contribute to the entire spectrum of cybersecurity as opposed to just a technical one. So I'm shifting my focus to be both on school leavers, but also people transitioning from a different career into cybersecurity. 100% you are speaking to the converted. I am a late bloomer. I went to, I only graduated in 2019 and I, cybersecurity just interested me and I joined all the organizations and all the supports. And when the pandemic hit, I applied to the New Frontiers program. And I said, mm -hmm. I've got this idea for CyberPi, which is really based around communication, around educating. It's not technical, but obviously I understand cybersecurity. And through the New Frontiers program and just through all the different supports and maybe just the confidence of being a bit older, I have managed to become a cybersecurity entrepreneur in a startup. So yes, anybody out there, it's never too late. And that's really my one message that I'd love to share with you today. So um, we're on the same page there. Rebecca, what would you like? Which misconception? And you must see a number of them in your role. <laughs> yes, I do. I think one that I would really like to focus on, though, would be that idea of I'm not qualified enough, because this is something that, to be honest, I'm actually even having conversations with my, you know, my college friends who are still looking for jobs, still trying to find out what kind of career they want to go into. And they're always saying, oh, I can't apply for this job. I can't apply for that job. I'm not qualified enough for it. And I, I just think that that's that's a huge misconception in this industry, especially because I feel like that you're never going to be qualified enough to work in cybersecurity in regards of it's just too broad of a sector. There is just so much to learn and always new things to learn. That's the thing. It's an ever evolving sub subject and an ever evolving topic. And that's, do you know what, that's one of the greatest things about this um, industry that we're working in is because you're always learning new things. It's never you're going to know everything at one stage. So that would be my main thing would to get across. And this is mainly going for the students in there that saying that, hey, they don't have a degree in, you know, in ethical hacking. They don't have a degree in, you know, coding or how to uh, or networking or anything like that. That's OK. And we've hired people and me included that are, were not hired for their technical skills. And the one thing that I was told when I was hired was, you know, you can teach anyone the tech side of things, but you can't teach people how to be good with other people. And we want to hire, you know, the people that are that are, are good at communication, that are team players, that are able to brainstorm, but are also able to adapt and and learn and teach um, other people and you know work as a team together. Because at the end of the day, you know Rome wasn't built in a day. This is a ever-ending battle, and we're going to have to do it together. And numerous companies coming together, not just one organization. Exactly. I mean, if you're curious and you've got a low boredom threshold, cybersecurity is your career. <laughs> Exactly. Um, Seamus, what one misconception would you like to clear up today to finish up? Yeah, I think it's just following along on, on Rebecca's point. Uh, I think there's a lot of noise out there about cybersecurity. There's uh, a, a lot a lot of sense uh, that there's there's experts out there in cybersecurity. There's there's certainly experts in niche areas of cybersecurity, but you cannot get hung up in thinking that you you have to learn everything about uh, you know all elements of cybersecurity. It is such a broad church at this stage. And it's, you know, irrespective of whether you're coming from a technical background or a, a business background or a health science background or an agricultural background, et cetera, you can actually find your own niche area that pertains to cybersecurity. And sometimes you can actually become nearly overwhelmed by all the 
uh, co um, the conferences and the, the webinars and the videos that are out there all espousing different virtues of, of cybersecurity. But if you're able to find a particular area that really interests you, that's niche to your area, that really helps your organization, then I think that would that would be uh, what I'm trying to do is dispel the myth that you have to be an expert in all things cybersecurity. Exactly. Find your niche. So, Paul, again, your your area is very different. What's the one misconception that you see on a daily basis that you want to clear up? Um, I think it might be the case that people think, oh, I can't be hacked. You know, it'll never happen to me. So yeah. it's important for people to realize that if it's connected to the Internet, there's a very good possibility possibility that it can be hacked. And again, to report the matter if they have, like, I know there are people, there's, it's all about brand protection as well and reputational damage, you know, if, if they have been hacked, but every case will be investigated that is, has been reported. So please report it to your local station and we are here to assist them with the, every investigation. So we're all victims of the optimism bias. You know, I think one in three marriages end in divorce, but nobody, you know, everybody says up there to get married. And so when you think it won't happen to you, that, that is definitely, uh, that's your weakness, that's your vulnerability. So thank you, Paul, that, that's good advice. And finally, Colm, what one misconception would you like to clear up? Yeah, I suppose um, one, one thing that really strikes me is that we've, I think the, we've allowed the perception to grow up that making things more secure means making them more awkward to use. And I do think that is actually a legacy of a lot of our older technologies. So, I mean, those of us um, who work in large organizations, I've worked in large organizations are kind of used to the whole notion of having to you know, VPN in from your laptop, which inevitably meant that everything got really slow. And that's just one example of kind of many security technologies that have traditionally been put in place that have basically made the experience of using, of trying to use the applications more difficult. And I actually think that's changing. I think that um, the, the growth of cloud technologies, the growth of cloud services, et cetera, is allowing us to actually to create a set of, um, a set of services that are both easier and better and more productive and also more secure. And so, you know, I would really encourage organizations to embrace this new, um, this new generation of technologies because they can, you know, they can have it both ways. They can have more productive technology that's also more secure. That's it. And that brings us back to where we began the day with Owen Byrne talking about the innovation in Ireland. And there is so much innovation in the cybersecurity world. So it just remains for me to thank absolutely everyone, to all our wonderful presenters for their time, for the preparation, for their wisdom. And we will share their details on the Digital West website probably by tomorrow, as well as a record. You can request a recording. We'll put that up as well. Behind the scenes, I need to thank Laura Hegarty um, and Turner Graffiti from and all the staff at GMIT for putting this together for all the organization that none of us see. They just make it happen seamlessly. Um, for Hannah sitting here getting um, hashtag digital west trending today, thank you very much. And obviously to everybody here who turned up, I have the saying that I always say when we put on cybersecurity events, we're preaching to the choir. The only people that turn up are the people that are already doing cybersecurity and they're not the people we want to talk to. And I really think today we managed to reach a much broader audience. We had so many businesses from Galway. And the, and the rest of the country, we had so many students on the call, so many people from industry, so many people from academia. So it's been a wonderful, wonderful event. Um, I have to, you know, I might be a bit biased, but I have to say it's certainly been one of my favorite events so far. Um, leave today with that one thing principle. Just feel that either if you're in a business, feel empowered that there are supports out there and there are things you can do to build the defenses in your business. If you're a career changer or a student, leave today realizing that there is a fantastic path and we've shown you the routes to get there to a career in cybersecurity for whatever your unique talents are. Um, and for, you know, for all our presenters, thank you for showing the way forward to our students and for people just saying that this is how, you know, you can't be what you can't see. And we've got a, re we had a really broad panel today, everybody from different backgrounds. So feel empowered that you too can join, make a career in cybersecurity if that's your thing. Um, 
we talked so much about security awareness training and how it should be mandatory or how the, you know that's where the first place you begin is the education i know for a fact the the local enterprise office in galway have a cyber security for business course in march and it's 25 euro and i'm delivering it so you know Shameless plug there, but please, we've put on courses before and they haven't sold because I think people hide from cybersecurity. So we want you to feel it's doable and I can guarantee you, I do not make my courses dull. Finally, I mentioned it before and I've asked being asked being mentioned it again through New Frontiers, which is an enterprise island program. That's how I managed to get into cybersecurity. They are opening up a new program. Um, it will be on their website and I think the applications open from March. If you have an idea, a business idea, please please apply and if whatever your business idea is i can tell you that you're going to need to build security into it so there it thing so on that note i wish you all well enjoy the rest of your day and thank you so much thanks very much guys thanks everybody take care thanks a lot thank you everyone great event thank well you. done